Volpone, or The Fox, by Ben Jonson. The Argument Volpone, childless, rich, feigns sick, despairs, offers his state to hopes of several heirs, lies languishing. His parasite receives presents of all, assures, deludes, then weaves other cross-plots, which ope themselves, are told. New tricks for safety are sought, they thrive. When bold, each tempts the other again, and all are sold. Prologue Now, luck yet sends us, and a little wit will serve to make our play hit, according to the palates of the season. Here is rhyme, not empty of reason. This we were bid to credit from our poet, whose true scope, if you would know it, in all his poems still hath been this measure, to mix profit with your pleasure. And not as some, whose throats their envy failing, cry hoarsely, all he writes is railing. And when his plays come forth, think they can flout them, with saying he was a year about them. To this there needs no lie, but this his creature, which was two months since no feature, and though he dares give them five lives to mend it, tis known five weeks fully penned it. From his own hand without a coadjutor, novice, journeyman, or tutor, yet thus much I can give you as a token of his play's worth, no eggs are broken, nor quaking custards with fierce teeth affrighted, wherewith your rout are so delighted, nor hails he in a gull old ends reciting, to stop gaps in his loose writing, with such a deal of monstrous and forced action, as might make Bethlehem a faction. Nor made he his play for jests stolen from each table, but makes jests to fit his fable, and so presents quick comedy refined, as best critics have designed. The laws of time, place, persons he observeth, from no needful rule he swerveth, all gall and copperas from his ink he draineth, only a little salt remaineth, wherewith he'll rub your cheeks till red with laughter, they shall look fresh a week after. Act One, Scene One, A Room in Volpone's House. Enter Volpone and Mosca. Good morning to the day, and next, my gold, open the shrine that I may see my saint. Mosca withdraws the curtain and discovers piles of gold, plate, jewels, etc. Hail the world's soul and mine! More glad than is the teeming earth to see the longed-for sun peep through the horns of the celestial ram am I to view thy splendor darkening his, that lying here amongst my other hordes shewest like a flame by night, or like the day struck out of chaos when all darkness fled unto the center. O oh, thou son of Saul, but brighter than thy father, let me kiss with adoration thee and every relic of sacred treasure in this blessed room. Well did wise poets, by thy glorious name, title that age which they would have the best, thou being the best of things, and far transcending all style of joy in children, parents, friends, or any other waking dream on earth. Thy looks when they to Venus did describe, they should have given her twenty thousand cupids, such are thy beauties and our loves. Dear saint, riches, the dumb god that givest all men tongues, that canst do naught, and yet makest men do all things, the price of souls, even hell with thee to boot is made worth heaven. Thou art virtue, fame, honor, and all things else. Who can get thee, he shall be noble, valiant, honest, wise. And what he will, sir. Riches are in fortune a greater good than wisdom is in nature. True, my beloved Mosca. Yet I glory more in the cunning purchase of my wealth than in the glad possession, since I gain no common way. I use no trade, no venture. I wound no earth with plowshares. Fat no beasts to feed the shambles. Have no mills for iron, oil, corn, or men to grind them into powder. I blow no subtle glass, expose no ships to threatenings of the furrow-faced sea. I turn no monies in the public bank, nor use her private. No, sir. 
nor devour soft prodigals. You shall have some will swallow a melting air as glibly as your Dutch will pills of butter, and ne'er purge for it. Tear forth the fathers of poor families out of their beds, and coffin them alive in some kind clasping prison, where their bones may be forthcoming, where the flesh is rotten. But your sweet nature doth abhor these courses. You loathe the widows or the orphans' tears should wash your pavements, or their piteous cries ring in your roofs and beat the air for vengeance. Right, Mosca, I do loathe it. And besides, sir, you are not like a thresher that doth stand with a huge flail, watching a heap of corn, and hungry dares not taste the smallest grain, but feeds on mallows and such bitter herbs, nor like the merchant, who hath filled his vaults with Romagna and rich Candian wines, yet drinks the lees of Lombard's vinegar. You will not lie in straw, whilst moths and worms feed on your sumptuous hangings and soft beds. You know the use of riches, and dare give now from that bright heap to me, your poor observer, or to your dwarf, or your hermaphrodite, your eunuch, or what other household trifle your pleasure allows maintenance. Hold thee, Mosca. Gives him money. Take of my hand. Thou strikest on truth in all, and they are envious term thee parasite. Call forth my dwarf, my eunuch, and my fool, and let them make me sport. Exit Mosca. What should I do but cocker up my genius, and live free to all delights my fortune calls me to? I have no wife, no parent, child, ally to give my substance to, but whom I make must be my heir, and this makes men observe me. This draws new clients daily to my house. Women and men of every sex and age that bring me presents send me plate, coin, jewels, with hope that when I die, which they expect each greedy minute, it shall then return tenfold upon them whilst some, covetous above the rest, seek to engross me whole, and counterwork the one unto the other, contend in gifts as they would seem in love. Oh, which I suffer, playing with their hopes, and am content to coin them into profit, to look upon their kindness, and take more, and look on that, still bearing them in hand, letting the cherry knock against their lips, and draw it by their mouths, and back again. How now? Re-enter Mosca with Nano, Andragino, and Castrone. Now room for fresh gamesters, who do will you to know, they do bring you neither play nor university show, and therefore do entreat you that whatsoever they rehearse may not fare a whit the worse for the false pace of the verse. If you wonder at this, you will wonder more ere we pass, for know, here is enclosed the soul of Pythagoras, that juggler divine as hereafter shall follow. Which soul, fast and loose, sir, first came from Apollo and was breathed into Ethelides, Mercurius his son, where it had the gift to remember all that ever was done. From thence it fled forth and made quick transmigration to Goldilocked Euphorbus, who was killed in good fashion at the siege of old Troy by the cuckold of Sparta. Hermotimus was next, I find it in my charts, to whom it did pass where no sooner it was missing, but with one Pyrrhus of Delos it learned to go a-fishing, and thence did it enter the sophist of Greece. From Pythagore she went into a beautiful piece, hight Aspasia, the Meretrix, and the next toss of her was again of a whore. She became a philosopher, Crates the Cynic, as itself doth relate it. Since kings, knights, and beggars, knaves, lords, and fools gat it, besides ox and ass, camel, mule, goat, and brock, in all which it hath spoke, as in the cobbler's cock. But I come not here to discourse of that matter, or his one, two, or three, or his great oath, by quater, his musics, his trigon, his golden thigh, or his telling how elements shift. But I would ask, how of late thou best suffered translation, and shifted thy coat, in these days of reformation. Like one of the reformed, a fool, as you see, counting all old doctrine heresy. But not on thine own forbid meats hast thou ventured? On fish, when first a Carthusian I entered. 
why then thy dogmatical silence hath left thee of that an obstreperous lawyer bereft me oh wonderful change when sir lawyer forsook thee for pythagore's sake what body then took thee a good dull mule and how by that means thou wert brought to allow of the eating of beans yes mm. but from the mule into whom didst thou pass into a very strange beast by some writers called an ass by others a precise pure illuminate brother of those devour flesh and sometimes one another and will drop you forth a libel or a sanctified lie betwixt every spoonful of nativity pie now quit thee for heaven of that profane nation and gently report thy next transmigration to the same that i am a creature of delight and what is more than a fool an hermaphrodite now prithee sweet soul in all thy variation which body wouldst thou choose to keep up thy station troth this i am in even here would i tarry cause here the delight of each sex thou canst vary alas those pleasures be stale and forsaken no tis your fool wherewith i am so taken the only one creature that i can call blest for all other forms i have proved most distressed spoke true as thou wert in pythagoras still this learned opinion we celebrate will fellow eunuch as behooves us with all our wit and art to dignify that whereof ourselves are so great and special a part now very very pretty mosca this was thy invention if it please my patron not else it doth good mosca then it was sir nano and castrone sing fools they are the only nation worth men's envy or admiration free from care or sorrow-taking selves and others merry-making all they speak or do is sterling your fool he is your great man's darling and your lady's sport and pleasure tongue and bauble are his treasure e'en his faith begetteth laughter and he speaks truth free from slaughter he's the grace of every feast and sometimes the chiefest guest hath his trencher and his stool when wit waits upon the fool oh who would not be he 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 knocking without who's that away exeunt nono and castrone look mosca fool be gone exit androgyno tis signor voltore the advocate i know him by his knock <laughs> fetch me my gown my furs and nightcaps say my couch is changing and let him entertain himself a while without i the gallery exit mosca now now my clients begin their visitation <laughs> vulture kite raven and gorecrow all my birds of prey that think me turning carcass now they come i am not for them yet re-enter mosca with the gown etc how now the news a piece of plate sir of what bigness huge massy and antique with your name inscribed and arms engraven good and not a fox stretched on the earth with fine delusive slights mocking a gaping crow huh mosca sharp sir give me my furs puts on his sick dress why dost thou laugh so man <laughs> i cannot choose sir when i apprehend what thoughts he has without now as he walks that this might be the last gift he should give that this would fetch you if you died to-day and gave him all what he should be to-morrow what large return would come of all his ventures how he should worshipped be and reverenced ride with his furs and footcloths waited on by herds of fools and clients have clear way made for his mule as lettered as himself be called the great and learned advocate and then concludes there's naught impossible yes to be learned mosca oh no rich implies it hood an ass with reverend purple so you can hide his too ambitious ears and he shall pass for a cathedral doctor my caps my caps good mosca fetch him in stay sir your ointment for your eyes 
that's true. Dispatch, dispatch. I long to have possession of my new present. That and thousands more I hope to see you lord of. Thanks, kind Mosca. And that when I am lost in blended dust, and hundreds such as I am in succession. Nay, that were too much, Mosca. You shall live still to delude these harpies. Loving Mosca. Tis well. My pillow now, and let him enter. Exit Mosca. Now my feigned cough, my physic, and my gout, my apoplexy, palsy, and catars, help with your forced functions this my posture, wherein this three year I have milked their hopes. He comes, I hear him. Uh, 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 oh. Re enter Mosca, introducing Voltore with a piece of plate. You still are what you were, sir. Only you of all the rest are he commands his love, and you do wisely to preserve it thus, with early visitation and kind notes of your good meaning to him, which I know cannot but come most grateful. Patron, sir, here Signor Voltore is come. What say you? Sir, Signor Voltore is come this morning to visit you. I thank him. And hath brought a piece of antique plate, bought of St. Mark, with which he here presents you. He is welcome. Pray him to come more often. Yes. What says he? He thanks you and desires you see him often. Mosca. My patron. Bring him near. Where is he? I long to feel his hand. The plate is here, sir. How fare you, sir? I thank you, Signor Voltore. Where is the plate? Mine eyes are bad. Voltore, putting it into his hands. I'm sorry to see you still thus weak. Mosca, aside, that he's not weaker. You are too munificent. No, sir, would to heaven I could as well give health to you as that plate. You give, sir what you can i thank you your love hath taste in this and shall not be unanswered i pray you see me often yes i shall sir be not far from me do you observe that sir hearken unto me still it will concern you you are a happy man sir know your good i cannot now last long you are his heir sir am i i feel me going <laughs> i'm sailing to my port <laughs> and i am glad i am so near my haven alas kind gentleman well we all must go but mosca age will conquer pray thee hear me am i inscribed his heir for certain are you? I do beseech you, sir, you will vouchsafe to write me in your family. All my hopes depend upon your worship. I am lost except the rising sun do shine on me. It shall both shine and warm thee, Mosca. Oh, sir, I am a man that hath not done your love all the worst offices. Here I wear your keys, see all your coffers and your caskets locked, keep the poor inventory of your jewels, your plate and monies, am your steward, sir, husband your goods here. But am I sole heir? Without a partner, sir, confirmed this morning, the wax is warm yet and the ink scarce dry upon the parchment. Happy, happy me! By what good chance, sweet Mosca? Your desert, sir. I know no second cause. Thy modesty is not to know it. Well, we shall requite it. He ever liked your course, sir. That first took him. I oft have heard him say how he admired men of your large profession, that could speak to every cause, and things mere contraries till they were hoarse again, yet all be law that with most quick agility could turn and re-return, could make knots and undo them, and give forked counsel, take provoking gold on either hand and put it up. These men, he knew, would thrive with their humility. 
and for his part he thought he should be blessed to have his air of such a suffering spirit, so wise, so grave, of so perplexed a tongue, and loud withal, that would not wag nor scarce lie still without a fee, when every word your worship but lets fall is a sheck in. Loud knocking without. Who's that? One knocks. I would not have you seem, sir. And yet, pretend you came and went in haste. I'll fashion an excuse. And, gentle sir, when you do come to swim in golden lard, up to the arms in honey, that your chin is borne up stiff with fatness of the flood, think on your vassal. But remember me. I have not been your worst of clients. Mosca! When will you have your inventory brought, sir? Or see a copy of the will? Anon! I will bring them to you, sir. Away, be gone. Put business in your face. Exit Voltore. Volpone springing up. Excellent Mosca! <laughs> Come hither, let me kiss thee. Keep you still, sir. Here is Corbaccio. Set the plate away. The vulture's gone and the old ravens come. Betake you to your silence and your sleep. Stand there and multiply. Putting the plate to the rest. Now, shall we see a wretch who is indeed more impotent than this can feign to be, yet hopes to hop over his grave? Enter Corbaccio. Signor Corbaccio, you're very welcome, sir. How does your patron? Troth, as he did, sir, no amends. What? Mends he? No, sir, he's rather worse. That's well. Where is he? Upon his couch, sir, newly fallen asleep. Does he sleep well? No wink, sir, all this night, nor yesterday but slumbers. Good. He should take some counsel of physicians. I have brought him an opiate here from mine own doctor. He will not hear of drugs. Why? I myself stood by while it was made, saw all the ingredients, and know it cannot but most gently work. My life for his... "'Tis but to make him sleep. Volpone, aside. Ay, his last sleep, if he would take it. Sir, he has no faith in physic. Say you? Say you? He has no faith in physic. He does think most of your doctors are the greater danger and worse disease to escape. I often have heard him protest that your physician should never be his heir. Not I his heir? Not your physician, sir. Oh, no, 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 I, I do not mean it. No, sir, nor their fees he cannot brook. He says they flay a man before they kill him. Right, I do conceive you. And then they do it by experiment, for which the law not only doth absolve them, but gives them great reward, and he is loath to hire his death so. It is true. They kill with as much license as a judge. Nay, more, for he but kills sure where the law condemns, and these can kill him too. Ay, or me, or any man. How does his apoplex? Is that strong in him still? Most violent. His speech is broken and his eyes are set, his face drawn longer than t'was wont. How, how? Stronger than he was wont? No, sir, his face drawn longer than t'was wont. Oh, good. His mouth is ever gaping and his eyelids hang. Good. A freezing numbness stiffens all his joints and makes the colour of his flesh like lead. Tis good. His pulse beats slow and dull. Good symptoms still. And from his brain... I conceive you good. Flows a cold sweat with a continual room, forth the resolved corners of his eyes. Is it possible? Yet I am better. <laughs> How does he with the swimming of his head? Oh, sir, tis past the scotomy. He now hath lost his feeling and hath left to snort. You hardly can perceive him that he breathes. Excellent, excellent. Sure I shall outlast him. This makes me young again, a score of years. 
I was coming for you, sir. Has he made his will? What has he given me? No, sir. Nothing? Hmm. He has not made his will, sir. Oh, oh, oh. But what did Voltore, the lawyer, hear? He smelt a carcass, sir, when he but heard my master was about his testament, as I did urge him to it for your good. He came unto him, did he? I thought so. Yes, and presented him this piece of plate. To be his heir. I do not know, sir. True, I know it too. Masca, aside. By your own scale, sir. Well, I shall prevent him yet. See, Mosca, look. Here I have brought a bag of bright check wines. We'll quite weigh down his plate. Mosca, taking the bag. Yea, marry, sir, this is true physic, this your sacred medicine. No talk of opiates to this great elixir. Tis aurum palpabile, if not portabile. It shall be ministered to him in his bowl. I do, do, do. Most blessed cordial, this will recover him. Yes, do, do, do. I think it were not best, sir. What? To recover him. Oh, no, 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 by no means. Why, sir, this will work some strange effect if he but feel it. Tis true, therefore forbear. I'll take my venture. Give it me again. At no hand, pardon me. You shall not do yourself that wrong, sir. I will so advise you, you shall have it all. How? All, sir. Tis your right, your own. No man can claim a part. Tis yours without a rival, decreed by destiny. How, how, good Bosca? I'll tell you, sir. This fit he shall recover. I do conceive you. And on first advantage of his gained sense will I re-importune him unto the making of his testament, and show him this. Pointing to the money. Good, good. Tis better yet if you will hear, sir. Yes, with all my heart. Now, would I counsel you, make home with speed. There frame a will, whereto you shall inscribe my master, your sole heir. And disinherit my son? Oh, sir, the better, for that colour shall make it much more taking. Oh, but colour. This will, sir, you shall send it unto me. Now, when I come to enforce, as I will do, your cares, your watchings, and your many prayers, your more than many gifts, your this day's present at last produce your will, where, without thought, or at least regard, unto your proper issue, a son so brave and highly meriting, the stream of your diverted love hath thrown you upon my master, and made him your heir. He cannot be so stupid or stone dead, but out of conscience and mere gratitude. He must pronounce me his. Tis true. This plot I did think on before. I do believe it. Do you not believe it? Yes, sir. My own project? Which, when he hath done, sir? Published me his heir? And you so certain to survive him? Aye. Being so lusty a man? Tis true. Yes, sir. I thought on that too. See how he should be the very organ to express my thoughts. You have not only done yourself a good. But multiplied it on my son. "'Tis right, sir. "'Still, my invention. "'Lass, sir, heaven knows it has been all my study, all my care, "'I e'en go grey withal, how to work things. "'I do conceive, sweet Mosca. "'You are he for whom I labour here. "'I do, do, do. "'I'll straight about it. "'Going. "'Rook go with you, raven. "'I know the honest. Masca. Aside, you do lie, sir. And? Your knowledge is no better than your ears, sir. I do not doubt to be a father to thee. Nor I to gull my brother of his blessing. I may have my youth restored to me. Why not? Your worship is a precious ass. What sayest thou? 
I do desire your worship to make haste, sir. Tis done, tis done. I go. Exit. Volpone, leaping from his couch. Oh, I shall burst! <laughs> let out my sides, let out my sides! <laughs> Contain your flux of laughter, sir. You know this hope is such a bait, it covers any hook. Oh, but thy working and thy placing it, I cannot hold. Good rascal, let me kiss thee. I never knew thee in so rare a humour. Alas, sir, I but do as I am taught. Follow your grave instructions, give them words, pour oil into their ears, and send them hence. Tis true, tis true. What a rare punishment is avarice to itself. Aye, with our help, sir. So many cares, so many maladies, so many fears attending on old age. Yea, death so often called on, as no wish can be more frequent with them, their limbs faint, their senses dull, their seeing, hearing, going, all dead before them. Yea, their very teeth, their instruments of eating failing them. Yet this is reckoned life. Nay, here was one, is now gone home, that wishes to live longer. Feels not his gout nor palsy, feigns himself younger by scores of years, flatters his age with confident belying it, hopes he may, with charms like Eson, have his youth restored, and with these thoughts so battens, as if fate would be as easily cheated on as he, and all turns air. Knocking within. Who's that there now? A third? Close, to your couch again. I hear his voice. It is Corvino, our spruce merchant. Volpone lies down as before. Dead. Another bout, sir, with your eyes. Anointing them. Who's there? Enter Corvino. Signor Corvino, come most wished for. Oh, how happy were you if you knew it now. Why? What? We're in. The tardy hour is come, sir. He is not dead? Not dead, sir, but as good. He knows no man. How shall I do then? Why, sir? I have brought him here a pearl. Uh, perhaps he has so much remembrance left as to know you, sir. He still calls on you. Nothing but your name is in his mouth. Is your pearl orient, sir? Venice was never the owner of the like. Signor Corvino. Hark. Signor Corvino. He calls you. Step and give it him. He's here, sir. And he has brought you a rich pearl. How do you do, sir? Tell him it doubles the twelfth carat. Sir, he cannot understand. His hearing's gone. And yet it comforts him to see you. Say I have a diamond for him, too. Best show it, sir. Put it into his hand. Tis only there he apprehends. He has his feeling yet. I'll see how he grasps it. Alas, good gentleman, how pitiful the sight is. Tut, forget, sir. The weeping of an heir should still be laughter under a visor. Why, am I his heir? Sir, I am sworn I may not show the will till he be dead. But here has been Corbaccio, here has been Voltore, here were others too, I cannot number them, they were so many, all gaping here for legacies. But I, taking the vantage of his naming you, Signor Corvino, Signor Corvino, took paper and pen and ink, and there I asked him whom he would have his heir. Corvino. Who should be executor? Corvino. And to any question he was silent to, I still interpreted the nods he made through weakness for consent, and sent home the others, nothing bequeathed them but to cry and curse. Oh, my dear Mosca. They embrace. Does he not perceive us? No more than a blind harper. He knows no man, no face of friend, nor name of any servant, who twas that fed him last, or gave him drink. Not those he hath begotten or brought up can he remember. Has he children? Bastards. Some dozen or more, that he begot on beggars, gypsies and Jews, and blackamoors when he was drunk. Knew you not that, sir? Tis the common fable. The dwarf, the fool, the eunuch are all his. He's the true father of his family and all save me, but he has given them nothing. That's well, that's well. Art sure he does not hear us? Sure, sir. Why, look you, credit your own sense. Shouts in Volpone's ear. The pox approach and add to your diseases. If it would send you hence the sooner, sir, for your incontinence, it hath deserved it thoroughly and thoroughly, and the plague to boot. 
you may come near, sir. Would you at once close those filthy eyes of yours that flow with slime like two frog pits, and those same hanging cheeks covered with hide instead of skin? Nay, help, sir, that look like frozen dish clout set on end. Corvino, aloud. Or like an old smoked wall on which the rain ran down in streaks. Excellent. Sir, speak out. You may be louder yet. A culverin discharged in his ear would hardly bore it. His nose is like a common sewer, still running. Tis good. And what is mouth? A very draught. Oh, stop it up. By no means. Pray you let me. Faith, I could stifle him rarely with a pillow, as well as any woman that should keep him. Do as you will, but I'll be gone. Be so. It is your presence makes him last so long. I pray you, use no violence. No, sir, why? Why should you be thus scrupulous, pray you, sir? Nay, at your discretion. Well, good sir, be gone. I will not trouble him now to take my pearl. Puh, nor your diamond. What a needless care is this afflicts you. Is not all here yours? Am not I here whom you have made your creature, that owe my being to you? Grateful Mosca, thou art my friend, my fellow, my companion, my partner, and shall share in all my fortunes. Excepting one. What's that? Your gallant wife, sir. Exit Corvino. Now is he gone. We had no other means to shoot him hence but this. My divine Mosca, thou hast today outdone thyself. Knocking within. Who's there? I will be troubled with no more. Prepare me music, dances, banquets, all delights. The Turk is not more sensual in his pleasures than will Volpone. Exit Mosca. Let me see. A pearl? A diamond? Plate? Shikines? Good morning's purchase. Why, this is better than robbed churches yet, or fat by eating once a month a man. Re-enter Mosca. Who is't? The beauteous lady would be, sir, wife to the English knight Sir Politic would be. This is the style, sir, has directed me. Hath sent to know how you have slept to-night, and if you would be visited. Not now. Some three hours hence. I told the squire so much. When I am high with mirth and wine, then, then... For heaven I wonder at the desperate valour of the bold English, that they dare let loose their wives to all encounters. Sir, this knight had not his name for nothing. He is politic, and knows, howe'er his wife affect strange airs, she hath not yet the face to be dishonest. But had she Signor Corvino's wife's face? Has she so rare a face? Oh, sir, the wonder, the blazing star of Italy, a wench of the first year! A beauty ripe as harvest, whose skin is whiter than a swan all over, than silver, snow, or lilies. A soft lip would tempt you to eternity of kissing, and flesh that melteth in the touch to blood. Bright as your gold, and lovely as your gold. Why had I not known this before? Alas, sir, myself but yesterday discovered it. How might I see her? Oh, not possible. She's kept as warily as as your gold. Never does come abroad, never takes air, but at a window. All her looks are sweet, as the first grapes or cherries, and are watched as near as they are. I must see her. Sir, there is a guard of spies ten thick upon her, all his whole household, each of which is set upon his fellow, and have all their charge when he goes out, when he comes in, examined. I will go see her, though but at her window. In some disguise, then. That is true. I must maintain mine own shape still the same. We'll think. Exeunt. End of Act One. Act Two. Scene One. St. Mark's Place, a retired corner before Corvino's house. Enter Sir Politic Woodby and Peregrine. Sir, to a wise man, all the world's his soil. It is not Italy, nor France, nor Europe that must bound me if my fates call me forth. Yet, I protest, it is no salt desire of seeing countries, shifting a religion, nor any dissatisfaction to the state where I was bred, and unto which I owe my dearest plots, hath brought me out, much less that idle, antique, stale, grey-headed project of knowing men's minds and manners with Ulysses, but a peculiar humour of my wife's, laid for this height of venice to observe to quote to learn the language and so forth 
I hope you travel, sir, with license? Yes. I dare the safelier converse. How long, sir, since you left England? Seven weeks. So lately? You have not been with my lord ambassador? Not yet, sir. Pray you, what news, sir, vents our climate? I heard last night a most strange thing reported by some of my lord's followers, and I long to hear how twill be seconded. What was it, sir? Marry, sir, of a raven that should build in a ship royal of the king's. Peregrine, aside. This fellow, does he gull me, trow, or is gulled? Your name, sir? My name is Politic Woodby. Peregrine, aside. Oh, that speaks him. A knight, sir. A poor knight, sir. Your lady lies here in Venice for intelligence of tires and fashions and behavior among the courtesans. The fine lady would be. Yes, sir. The spider and the bee oft times suck from one flower. Good, sir, politic, I cry you mercy. I have heard much of you. Tis true, sir, of your raven. On your knowledge? Yes, and your lion's whelping in the tower. Another whelp? Another, sir. Now, heaven, what progenies be these? The fires at Berwick, and the new star, these things concurring strange and full of omen. Saw you those meteors? I did, sir. Fearful! Pray you, sir, confirm me. Were there three porpoises seen above the bridge as they give out? Six, and a sturgeon, sir. I am astonished. Nay, sir, be not so. I'll tell you a greater prodigy than these. What should these things portend? The very day, let me be sure, that I put forth from London, there was a whale discovered in the river, as high as Woolwich, that had waited there, few know how many months, for the subversion of the stowed fleet. Is it possible? Believe it. T'was either sent from Spain or the Archduke's. Spinola's whale, upon my life, my credit. Will they not leave these projects? Were these, sir, some other news? Faith. Stone the fool is dead, and they do lack a tavern fool extremely. Is Mass Stone dead? He's dead, sir. Why, I hope you thought him not immortal. Aside. Oh, this knight, were he well known, would be a precious thing to fit our English stage. He that should write but such a fellow should be thought to feign extremely, if not maliciously. Stone dead? Dead. Lord. How deeply, sir, you apprehended. He was no kinsman to you? That I know of. Well, that same fellow was an unknown fool. And yet you knew him, it seems. I did so. Sir, I knew him one of the most dangerous heads living within the state, and so I held him. Indeed, sir? While he lived in action. He has received weekly intelligence upon my knowledge out of the low countries for all parts of the world in cabbages, and those dispensed again to ambassadors in oranges, muskmelons, apricots, lemons, palm citrons, and such like, sometimes in Colchester oysters and your Celsi cockles. You make me wonder. Sir, upon my knowledge, nay, I've observed him at your public ordinary take his advertisement from a traveller, a concealed statesman, in a trencher of meat, and instantly, before the meal was done, convey an answer in a toothpick. Strange! How could this be, sir? Why, the meat was cut so like his character, and so laid as he might easily read the cipher. I have heard he could not read, sir. So it was given out, in policy, by those that did employ him. But he could read, and had your languages, and toot as sound a noodle. I have heard, sir, that your baboons were spies, and that they were a kind of subtle nation near to China. Ay, ay, your Mamelucci. Faith, they had their hand in a French plot or two, but they were so extremely given to women, as they made discovery of all. Yet I had my advices here, on Wednesday last. From one of their own coat they were returned, made their relations as the fashion is, and now stand fair for fresh employment. Hot. Aside. This Sir Paul will be ignorant of nothing. 
It seems, sir, you know all. Not all, sir, but I have some general notions. I do love to note and to observe. Though I live out free from the act of torrent, yet I'd mark the currents and the passages of things for my own private use, and know the ebbs and flows of state. Believe it, sir, I hold myself in no small tie unto my fortunes for casting me thus luckily upon you, whose knowledge, if your bounty equal it, may do me great assistance in instruction for my behaviour and my bearing, which is yet so rude and raw. Why came you forth empty of rules for travel? Faith, I had some common ones from out that vulgar grammar which he that cried Italian to me taught me. Why, this it is that spoils all our brave bloods, trusting our hopeful gentry under pedants, fellows of outside, and mere bark. You seem to be a gentleman of ingenuous race. I not profess it, but my fate hath been to be where I have been consulted with, in this high kind, touching some great men's sons, persons of blood and honour. Enter Mosca and Nano disguised, followed by persons with materials for erecting a stage. Who be these, sir? Under that window, that must be. The same. Fellows, to mount a bank, did your instructor in the dear tongues never discourse to you of the Italian mountebanks? Yes, sir. Why, here shall you see one. They are quacksalvers, fellows that live by venting oils and drugs. Was that the character he gave you of them? as i remember pity his ignorance they are the only knowing men of europe great general scholars excellent physicians most admired statesmen professed favourites and cabinet counsellors to the greatest princes the only languaged men in all the world and i have heard they are most lewd impostors made of all terms and shreds no less beliers of great men's favours than their own vile medicines, which they will utter upon monstrous oaths, selling their drug for tuppence ere they part, which they have valued at twelve crowns before. Sir, calumnities are answered best with silence. Yourself shall judge. Who is it mounts, my friend? Scotto of Mantua, sir. Isn't he? Nay, then, I'll proudly promise, sir, you shall behold another man that has been fantasized to you. I wonder yet that he should mount his bank here in this nook that has been wont to appear in face of the piazza. Here he comes. Enter Volpone, disguised as a mountebank doctor, and followed by a crowd of people. Volpone, Tunano. Mount Zany. Follow, follow. Follow, follow, follow. See how the people follow him? He's a man may write ten thousand crowns in bank here. Note. Volpone mounts the stage. Mark but his gesture. I do use to observe the state he keeps in getting up. Tis worth it, sir. Most noble gentlemen, and my worthy patrons, it may seem strange that I, your Scoto Mantuano, who was ever wont to fix my bank in the face of the public piazza, near the shelter of the portico to the procuratia, should now, after eight months' absence from this illustrious city of Venice, humbly retire myself into an obscure nook of the piazza. Did I not now object the same? Peace, sir. Let me tell you... I am not, as your Lombard proverb saith, cold on my feet, or content to part with my commodities at a cheaper rate than I accustomed, look not for it, nor that the calumnious reports of that impudent detractor and shame to our profession, Alessandro Butoni, I mean, who gave out in public I was condemned a sforzato to the galleys for poisoning the Cardinal Bembo's cook hath at all attached, much less dejected me. No, no, worthy gentlemen, to tell you true, I cannot endure to see the rabble of these ground charlatani that spread their cloaks on the pavement as if they meant to do feats of activity and then come in lamely with their moldy tails out of Boccaccio like stale Tabarine the fabulous. 
some of them discoursing their travels and of their tedious captivity in the Turks' galleys, when, indeed, were the truth known, they were the Christians' galleys, where very temperately they eat bread and drunk water as a wholesome penance enjoined them by their confessors for base pilferies. Note but his bearing and contempt of these. These turdy facy nasty pate lousy farticle rogues, with one poor groat's worth of unprepared antimony, finely wrapped up in several scartochios, are able very well to kill their twenty a week and play. Yet these meagre, starved spirits, who have half stopped the organs of their minds with earthy oppilations, want not their favorers among your shriveled salad eating artisans, who are overjoyed that they may have their half perth of physic, though it purge them into another world, it makes no matter. Excellent. Have you heard better language, sir? Well, let them go. And gentlemen, honorable gentlemen, know that for this time our bank being thus removed from the clamors of the canalia shall be the scene of pleasure and delight, for I have nothing to sell, little or nothing to sell. I told you, sir, his end. You did so, sir. I protest I and my six servants are not able to make of this precious liquor so fast as it is fetched away from my lodging by gentlemen of your city, strangers of the terra firma, worshipful merchants, I and senators too, who ever since my arrival have detained me to their uses by their splendidous liberalities, and worthily, for what avails your rich man to have his magazine stuffed with Moscadelli, or of the purest grape, when his physicians prescribe him on pain of death to drink nothing but water cocked with aniseeds? Oh, health, health, the blessing of the rich, the riches of the poor. Who can buy thee at too dear a rate, since there is no enjoying this world without thee? Be not then so sparing of your purses, honorable gentlemen, as to abridge the natural course of life. You see his end. Aye, is not good? For when a humid flux, or catar, by the mutability of air, falls from your head into an arm, or shoulder, or any other part, Take you a ducat or your chequin of gold and apply to the place affected. See what good effect it can work. No, no, tis this blessed unguento, this rare extraction that hath only power to disperse all malignant humors that proceed either of hot, cold, moist, or windy causes. I would ye had put in dry too. Pray you, observe to fortify the most indigest and crude stomach. I were it of one that, through extreme weakness, vomited blood, applying only a warm napkin to the place after the unction and fricace, for the vertigine in the head, putting but a drop into your nostrils, likewise behind the ears, a most sovereign and approved remedy. The mal caduccio, cramps, convulsions, paralyses, epilepsies, tremor cordia, retired nerves, ill vapors of the spleen, stopping of the liver, the stone, the strangury, hernia ventosa, illatia passio, stops a dysenteria immediately, easeth the torsion of the small guts, and cures melancholia hypochondriaca, being taken and applied, according to my printed receipt. Pointing to his bill and his vial. For this is the physician, this the medicine, this counsels, this cures, this gives the direction, this works the effect, and in some both together may be termed an abstract of the theoric and practic in the Esculapian art. Twill cost you eight crowns, and, Zanfritada, prithee sing a verse extempore in honor of it. How do you like him, sir? Most strangely, I. Is not his language rare? But alchemy, I never heard the like, or Broughton's books. Nono sings. Had old Hippocrates or Galen, that to their books put medicines all in, but known this secret they had never, 
of which they will be guilty ever been murderers of so much paper or wasted many a hurtless taper no indian drug had e'er been famed tobacco sassafras not named nor yet of guacum one small stick sir nor raymond lully's great elixir nor had been known the danish gonswort or paracelsus with his long sword all this yet will not do eight crowns is high no more gentlemen if i had but time to discourse to you the miraculous effects of this my oil surnamed olio del scoto with the countless catalogue of those i have cured of the aforesaid and many more diseases the patents and privileges of all the princes and commonwealths of christendom or but the depositions of those that appeared on my part before the signory of the senita and most learned college of physicians where i was authorized upon notice taken of the admirable virtues of my medicaments and mine own excellency in matter of rare and unknown secrets not only to disperse them publicly in this famous city but in all the territories that happily joy under the government of the most pious and magnificent states of italy but may some other gallant fellow say oh there be diverse that make profession to have as good and as experimented receipts as yours indeed very many have essayed like apes in imitation of that which is really and essentially in me to make of this oil bestowed great cost in furnaces stills alembecs continual fires and preparation of the ingredients as indeed there goes to it six hundred several simples, besides some quantity of human fat for the congluination which we buy of the anatomists. But when these practitioners come to the last decoction, blow, blow, puff, puff, and all flies in fumo! <laughs> Poor wretches! I rather pity their folly and indiscretion than their loss of time and money, for these may be recovered by industry, but to be a fool born is a disease incurable. For myself, I always from my youth have endeavored to get the rarest secrets and book them either in exchange or for money. I spared nor cost nor labor where anything was worthy to be learned. And gentlemen, honorable gentlemen, I will undertake, by virtue of chemical art, out of the honorable hat that covers your head, to extract the four elements, that is to say, the fire, air, water, and earth, and return you your felt without burn or stain. For, whilst others have been at the baloo, I have been at my book and am now past the craggy paths of study and come to the flowery plains of honour and reputation i do assure you sir that is his aim but to our price and that with also paul you all know honourable gentlemen i never valued this ampulla or vial at less than eight crowns but for this time I am content to be deprived of it for six. Six crowns is the price, and less in courtesy I know you cannot offer me. Take it, or leave it howsoever, both it and I am at your service. I ask you not as the value of the thing, for then I should demand of you a thousand crowns, so the cardinals Montalto Pernese, the great duke of Tuscany, my gossip with diverse other princes have given me, but I despise money. Only to show my affection to you, honorable gentlemen, and your illustrious state here, I have neglected the messages of these princes, mine own offices, framed my journey hither only to present you with the fruits of my travels. Tune your voices once more to the touch of your instruments, and give the honorable assembly some delightful recreation. What monstrous and most painful circumstances here, to get some three or four gazettes, some threepence in the hole, for that will come to. Nano sings. You that would last long list to my song. Make no more coil, but buy of this oil. Would you be ever fair and young, 
stout of teeth and strong of tongue tart of palate quick of ear sharp of sight of nostril clear moist of hand and light of foot or i will come nearer to it would you live free from all diseases do the act your mistress pleases yet fright all aches from your bones here's a medicine for the knowns well i am in a humor at this time to make a present of the small quantity my coffer contains to the rich in courtesy and to the poor for god's sake wherefore now mark i asked you six crowns and six crowns at other times you have paid me you shall not give me six crowns nor five nor four nor three nor two nor one nor half a ducat no nor a mochinigo sixpence it will cost you or six hundred pound expect no lower price for by the banner of my front i will not bait a bagatine that i will have only a pledge of your loves to carry something from amongst you to show that i am not contemned by you therefore now toss your handkerchiefs cheerfully cheerfully and be advertised that the first heroic spirit that deigns to grace me with a handkerchief I will give it a little remembrance of something, beside shall please it better than if I had presented it with a double pistolet. Will you be that heroic boxer, Paul? Celia, at a window above, throws down her handkerchief. Oh, see, that window has prevented you. Lady, I kiss your bounty, and for this timely grace you have done your poor Scoto of Mantua, I will return you, over and above my oil, a secret of that high and inestimable nature shall make you forever enamoured on that minute wherein your eye first descended on so mean, yet not altogether to be despised, an object. Here is a powder concealed in this paper, of which, if I should speak to the worth, nine thousand volumes were but as one page, that page as a line, that line as a word. So short is this pilgrimage of man, which some call life, to the expressing of it. Would I reflect on the price? Why, the whole world is but as an empire, that empire as a province, that province as a bank, that bank as a private purse to the purchase of it. I will only tell you, it is the powder that made Venus a goddess, given her by Apollo, that kept her perpetually young, cleared her wrinkles, firmed her gums, filled her skin, colored her hair. From her derived to Helen, and at the sack of Troy unfortunately lost, till now, in this our age, it was as happily recovered by a studious antiquary out of some ruins of Asia, who sent a moiety of it to the court of France, but much sophisticated, wherewith the ladies there now color their hair. The rest at this present remains with me, extracted to a quintessence, so that wherever it but touches, in youth it perpetually preserves, in age restores the complexion. Seats your teeth did they dance like virginal jacks, firm as a wall, makes them white as ivory, that were black as... Enter Corvino. Spite of the devil and my shame, come down here, come down. No house but mine to make your scene. Signor Flaminio, will you come down, sir, down? What, is my wife your Franciscina, sir? No windows on the whole piazza here to make your properties but mine, but mine? Beats away, Volpone, Nano, etc. Heart, ere tomorrow I shall be new christened and called the Pantaloni di Besognosi about the town. What should this mean, sir, Paul? Some trick of state, believe it. I will home. It may be some design on you. I know not. I'll stand upon my guard. It is your best, sir. This three weeks, all my advices, all my letters, they have been intercepted. Indeed, sir. Best have a care. Nay, so I will. This night I may not lose him for my mirth till night. Exeunt. Scene two. A room in Volpone's house. Enter Volpone and Mosca. Oh, I am wounded. Where, sir? Not without. 
Those blows were nothing. I could bear them ever. But angry Cupid, bolting from her eyes, hath shot himself into me like a flame, where now he flings about his burning heat, as in a furnace an ambitious fire whose vent is stopped. The fight is all within me. I cannot live except thou help me, Mosca. My liver melts, and I, without the hope of some soft air from her refreshing breath, am but a heap of cinders. Lass, good sir, would you had never seen her. Nay, would thou hadst never told me of her. Sir, tis true. I do confess I was unfortunate and you unhappy. But I'm bound in conscience no less than duty to effect my best to your release of torment. And I will, sir. Dear Mosca, shall I hope? Sir, more than dear, I will not bid you to despair of aught within a human compass. Oh, there spoke my better angel. Mosca, take my keys. Gold, plate, and jewels, all's at thy devotion. Employ them how thou wilt. Nay, coin me too, so thou in this but crown my longings, Mosca. Use but your patience. So I have. I doubt not to bring success to your desires. Nay, then, I not repent me of my late disguise. If you can horn him, sir, you need not. True. Besides, I never meant him for my heir. Is not the colour of my beard and eyebrows to make me known? No, Jot. I did it well. So well would I could follow you in mine with half the happiness. Aside, and yet I would escape your epilogue. But were they gulled with a belief that I was Scoto? Sir, Scotto himself could hardly have distinguished. I have not time to flatter you now. We'll part. And as I prosper, so applaud my art. Exeunt. Scene three. A room in Corvino's house. Enter Corvino with his sword in his hand, dragging in Celia. Death of mine honour with the city's fall, a juggling, tooth-drawing, prating mountebank, and at a public window, where whilst he, with his strained action and his dole of faces, to his drug lecture draws your itching ears a crew of old, unmarried, noted lechers, stood leering up like satires, and you smile most graciously and fan your favours forth to give your hot spectators satisfaction? What, was your mountebank their call, their whistle, or were you enamoured of his copper rings, his saffron jewel, with the toadstone in it, or his embroidered suit with the cope stitch, made of a hearse cloth, or his old tilt feather, or his starched beard? Well, you shall have him, yes, he shall come home and minister unto you the fricassee for the mother. Or let me see, I think you'd rather mount, would you not mount? Why, if you'll mount, you may, yes, truly you may, and so you may be seen down to the foot. Get you a sitter, Lady Vanity, and be a dealer with the virtuous man. Make one, I'll but protest myself a cuckold and save your dowry. I'm a Dutchman, I, for if you thought me an Italian, you would be damned ere you did this, you whore. Thou'dst tremble to imagine that the murder of father, mother, brother, all thy race, should follow as the subject of my justice. Good sir, have patience. What? Couldst thou propose less to thyself than in this heat of wrath, and stung with my dishonour, I should strike this steel into thee with as many stabs as thou wert gazed upon with goatish eyes? Alas, sir, be appeased. I could not think my being at the window should more now move your impatience than at other times. No, not to seek and entertain a parley with a known knave before a multitude, you were an actor with your handkerchief, which he most sweetly kissed in the receipt, and might no doubt return it with a letter, and point the place where you might meet. Your sisters, your mothers, or your aunts might serve the turn. Why, dear sir, when do I make these excuses, or ever stir abroad but to the church, and that so seldom? Well, it shall be less, and thy restraint before was liberty to what I now decree, and therefore mark me. First I will have this bawdy light damned up, and till it be done, some two or three yards off, I'll chalk a line, o'er oh, which if thou but chance to set thy desperate foot, more hell, more horror, more wild, remorseless rage shall seize on thee than on a conjurer that had heedless left his circle safety ere his devil was laid. Then here's a lock which I will hang upon thee, and now I think on't, I will keep thee backwards. Thy lodging shall be backwards, thy walks backwards, thy prospect all be backwards, and no pleasure that thou shalt know but backwards. Nay, since you force my honest nature, know it is your own, being too open, makes me use you thus. Since you will not contain your subtle nostrils in a sweet room, but they must snuff the air of rank and sweaty passengers. Knocking within. One knocks. Away, and be not seen, pain of thy life. 
nor look toward the window. If thou dost, nay, stay, hear this, let me not prosper, whore, but I will make thee an anatomy, dissect thee mine own self, and read a lecture upon thee to the city, and in public. Away! Exit Celia. Enter servant. Who's there? Tis Signor Mosca, sir. Let him come in. Exit servant. His master's dead. There's yet some good to help the bad. Enter Mosca. My Mosca, welcome. I guess your news. I fear you cannot, sir. Is it not his death? Rather the contrary. Not his recovery? Yes, sir. I am cursed. I am bewitched. My crosses meet to vex me. How? How, 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 how? Why, sir, with Scotto's oil? Corbaccio and Voltore brought of it, whilst I was busy in an inner room. Death! That damned mountebank! But for the law now I could kill the rascal. It cannot be. His oil should have that virtue. Have not I known him a common rogue, come fiddling in to the Osteria with a tumbling whore, and when he has done all his forced tricks, been glad of a poor spoonful of dead wine with flies in it? It cannot be. All his ingredients are a sheep's gall, a roasted bitch's marrow, some few sod earwigs, pounded caterpillars, a little capon's grease, and fasting spittle. I know them to a dram. I know not, sir, but some aren't there. They poured into his ears, some in his nostrils, and recovered him, applying but the fricassee. Pox on that fricassee. And since, to seem the more officious and flattering of his health there, they have had, at extreme fees, the College of Physicians consulting on him, how they might restore him, where one would have a cataplasm of spices, another a flayed ape clapped to his breast, the third would have it a dog, a fourth an oil with wildcat skins. At last, they all resolved that to preserve him was no other means, but some young woman must be straight sought out, lusty and full of juice to sleep by him. And to this service, uh, most unhappily and most unwillingly am I now employed, which here I thought to pre-acquaint you with, for your advice, since it concerns you most, because I would not do that thing might cross your ends on whom I have my whole dependence, sir. Yet if I do it not, they may delate my slackness to my patron, work me out of his opinion, and there all your hopes, ventures, or whatsoever are all frustrate. I do but tell you, sir, Besides, they are all now striving who shall first present him. And therefore, I could entreat you, briefly conclude somewhat, prevent them if you can. Death to my hopes. This is my villainous fortune. Best to hire some common courtesan. Aye, I thought on that, sir. But they are all so subtle, full of art, and age again doting and flexible. So as, I cannot tell, we may perchance light on a queen may cheat us all. It is true. No, no, it must be one that has no trick, sir. Some simple thing, a creature made unto it. Some wench you may command. Have you no kinswoman? Odd so. Think, 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 sir. One of the doctors offered there his daughter. How? Yes, Signor Lupo, the physician. His daughter? And a virgin, sir. Why? Alas, he knows the state of his body, what it is, that naught can warm his blood, sir, but a fever, nor any incantation raise his spirit. A long forgetfulness hath seized that part. Besides, sir, who shall know it? Some one or two? I prithee, give me leave. Walks aside. If any man but I had had this luck, the thing in itself I know is nothing, wherefore should not I as well command my blood and my affections as this dull doctor? In the point of honour, the cases are all one of wife and daughter. Masca, aside, I hear him coming. She shall do it, tis done, slight. If this doctor who is not engaged, unless it be for his counsel, which is nothing, offer his daughter, what should I that am so deeply in? I will prevent him, wretch, covetous wretch. Mosca, I have determined. How, sir? We'll make all sure. The party you wot of shall be mine own wife, Mosca. Sir? The thing, but that I would not seem to counsel you, I should have motioned to you at the first. And make your count, you have cut all their throats. Why, tis directly taking a possession. And in his next fit we may let him go. Tis but to pull the pillow from his head, and he is throttled. It had been done before, but for your scrupulous doubts. Aye, a plague on it. My conscience fools my wit. Well, I'll be brief. 
and so be thou, lest they should be before us. Go home, prepare him, tell him with what zeal and willingness I do it, swear it was on the first hearing, as thou mayst do truly, mine own free motion. Sir, I warrant you, I'll so possess him with it, that the rest of his starved clients shall be banished all, and only you received. But come not, sir, until I send, for I have something else to ripen for your good, you must not know it. But do not forget to send now. Fear not. Exit. Where are you, wife? My Celia? Wife? Re-enter Celia. What? Blubbering? Come dry those tears. I think thou thought'st me in earnest. Ha! By this light I talk so but to try thee. Methinks the lightness of the occasion should have confirmed thee. Come, I am not jealous. <laughs> no. Faith, I am not, I, nor ever was. It is a poor, unprofitable humour. Do not I know, if women have a will, they'll do all against all the watchers of the world, and that the fiercest spies are tamed with gold. Tut, I am confident in thee, thou shalt see it. And see, I'll give thee cause, too, to believe it. Come, kiss me. Go and make thee ready straight. In all thy best attire, thy choicest jewels, put them all on, and with them thy best looks. We are invited to a solemn feast at old Volpone's, where it shall appear, how far I am free from jealousy or fear. Exeunt. End of Act 2 Act 3, Scene 1 A street. Enter Masca. I fear I shall begin to grow in love with my dear self, and my most prosperous parts, they do so spring and burgeon. I can feel a whimsy in my blood. I know not how. Success hath made me wanton. I could skip out of my skin now like a subtle snake. I am so limber. Oh, your parasite is a most precious thing, dropped from above, not bred amongst clods and clodpoles here on earth. I muse the mystery was not made a science, it is so liberally professed. Almost all the wise world is little else in nature but parasites, or sub-parasites. And yet... I mean not those that have your bare town art, to know who's fit to feed them, have no house, no family, no care, and therefore mould tales for men's ears to bait that sense, or get kitchen invention, and some stale receipts to please the belly and the groin, nor those with their court dog tricks that can fawn and fleer, make their revenue out of legs and faces, echo, my lord, and lick away a moth. But your fine, elegant rascal, that can rise and stoop almost together like an arrow, shoot through the air as nimbly as a star, turn short as doth a swallow, and be here and there and here and yonder all at once, present to any humour, all occasion, and change a visor swifter than a thought. This is the creature had the art born with him toils not to learn it, but doth practice it out of most excellent nature. And such sparks are the true parasites, others but their zanies. Enter Benario. Who's this? Benario, old Corbaccio's son, the person I was bound to seek. Fair sir, you are happily met. That cannot be by thee. Why, sir? Nay, pray thee know thy way, and leave me. I would be loath to exchange discourse with such a mate as thou art. Courteous sir, scorn not my poverty. Not I, by heaven. But thou shalt give me leave to hate thy baseness. Baseness? Ay, answer me. Is not thy sloth sufficient argument? Thy flattery? Thy means of feeding? Heaven be good to me. These imputations are too common, sir, and easily stock on virtue when she's poor. You are unequal to me. And, however, your sentence may be righteous. Yet you are not that, ere you know me, thus proceed in censure. St. Mark bear witness against you. Tis inhuman. <laughs> Weeps. Benario, aside. What? Does he weep? The sign is soft and good. I do repent me that I was so harsh. Tis true that, 
swayed by strong necessity, I am enforced to eat my careful bread with too much obsequy. Tis true beside that I am fain to spin mine own poor raiment out of my mere observance, being not born to a free fortune. But that I have done base offices in rending friends asunder, dividing families, betraying counsels, whispering false lies, or mining men with praises, trained their credulity with perjuries, corrupted chastity, or am in love with mine own tender ease, but would rather not prove the most rugged and laborious course that might redeem my present estimation, let me here perish in all hope of goodness. Benario, aside. This cannot be a personated passion. I was to blame, so to mistake thy nature. Prithee, forgive me, and speak out thy business. Sir, it concerns you. And though I may seem at first to make a main offence in manners, and in my gratitude unto my master, yet for the pure love which I bear all right and hatred of the wrong, I must reveal it. This very hour... Your father is in purpose to disinherit you. How? And thrust you forth as a mere stranger to his blood. Tis true, sir. The work no way engageth me. But as I claim an interest in the general state of goodness and true virtue, which I here abound in you, and for which mere respect without a second aim, sir, I have done it. This tale has lost thee much of the late trust thou hast with me. It is impossible. I know not how to lend it any thought. My father should be so unnatural. It is a confidence that well becomes your piety, and formed, no doubt, it is from your own simple innocence, which makes your wrong more monstrous and abhorred. But, sir, I now will tell you more. This very minute it is, or will be doing, and if you shall but be pleased to go with me, I'll bring you. I do not say where you shall see, but where your ear shall be witness of the deed. Hear yourself, written bastard, and profess the commest issue of the earth. I am amazed. Sir, if I do it not, draw your just sword, and score your vengeance on my front and face. Mark me, your villain. You have too much wrong, and I do suffer for you, sir. My heart weeps blood in anguish. Lead, I follow thee. Exeunt. Scene two. A room in Volpone's house. Enter Volpone. Mosca stays long, methinks. Bring forth your sports, and help to make the wretched time more sweet. Enter Nano, Andragino, and Castrone. Dwarf, fool, and eunuch. <laughs> well met here we be. A question it were now, whether of us three, being all the known delicates of a rich man, in pleasing him, claim the precedence he can. I claim for myself. And so doth the fool. Tis foolish indeed. Let me set you both to school. First for your dwarf. He's little and witty. And everything as it is little is pretty. Else why do men say to a creature of my shape, so soon as they see him, it's a pretty little ape? And why a pretty ape, but for pleasing imitation of greater men's actions in a ridiculous fashion? Beside, this feet body of mine doth not crave half the meat, drink, and cloth one of your bulks will have. Admit your fool's face must be the mother of laughter, yet for his brain it must always come after. And though that do feed him, tis a pitiful case his body is beholding to such a bad face. Knocking within. Who's there? My couch. Away! Look! Nano, see! Exeunt Andragino and Castrone. Give me my caps first. Go, inquire. Exit Nano. Now, Cupid, send it be Mosca, and with fair return. Nano, within. It is the beauteous, madam. Would be? Is it? The same. Now torment on me. Squire her in, for she will enter or dwell here forever. Nay, quickly. Retires to his couch. That my fit were past. I fear a second hell, too, that my loathing this will quite expel my appetite to the other. Would she were taking now her tedious leave. Lord, how it threats me what I am to suffer. Re-enter Nano with Lady Politic Woodby. I thank you, good sir. 
play you signify unto your patron. I am here. This band shews not my neck enough. I trouble you, sir. Let me request you, bid one of my women come hither to me. In good faith, I am dressed most favourably to-day. It is no matter, tis well enough. Enter first waiting woman. Look, see these petulant things, how they have done this. Volpone, aside. I do feel the fever entering in at mine ears. Oh, for a charm to fright it hence. Come nearer. Is this curl in his right place, all this? Why is this higher than all the rest? You have not washed your eyes yet, or do they not stand even in your head? Where is your fellow? Call her. Exit first woman. Now St. Mark deliver us. Anon she will beat her women because her nose is red. Re-enter first woman with second woman. I pray you view this tire, forsooth. Are all things apt or no? One hair a little here sticks out, forsooth. Doest so, forsooth? And where was your dear sight when it did so, forsooth? What now, bird-eyed? And you too? Pray you, both approach and mend it. Now by that light I muse you are not ashamed. I, that have preached these things so often to you, read you the principles argued, all the grounds disputed, every fitness, every grace, called you to counsel of so frequent dressings. Nano, aside. More carefully than of your fame or honour. Made you acquainted what an ample dowry the knowledge of these things would be unto you, able alone to get you noble husbands at your return, you thus to neglect it. Besides, you seeing what a curious nation the Italians are, what will they say of me? The English lady cannot dress herself. Oh, here's a fine imputation to our country. Well, go your ways and stay in the next room. This fugus was too coarse, too. It's no matter. Good sir, you will give them entertainment? Exeunt Nano and waiting women. The storm comes toward me. Lady Politic goes to the couch. How does my Valpone? Troubled with noise, I cannot sleep. I dreamt that a strange fury entered now my house, and with the dreadful tempest of her breath did cleave my roof asunder. Believe me, and I had the most fearful dream could I remember it. Volpone, aside. Out on my fate, I have given her the occasion how to torment me. She will tell me hers. Methought the golden mediocrity, polite and delicate. Oh, if you do love me, no more. I sweat and suffer at the mention of any dream. Feel how I tremble yet. Alas, good soul, the passion of the heart. Seed pearl were good now, boiled with syrup of apples, tincture of gold and coral, citron pills, your ill campaign brute, microbalanes. Volpone, aside. Oh, me, I have taken a grasshopper by the wing. Burnt silk and amber, you have muscadel good in the house. You will not drink and part? No fear of that. I doubt we shall not get some English saffron. Half a dram would serve your sixteen clothes, a little musk, dried mints, bugloss and barley meal. Volpone, aside. She's in again. Before I feigned diseases, now I have one. And these applied with the right scarlet cloth. Volpone, aside. Another flood of words, a very torrent. Shall I, sir, make you a poultice? No, no, no. I am very well. You need prescribe no more. I have a little studied physic, but now I'm off of music, save in the forenoons, an hour or two for painting. I would have a lady, indeed, to have all letters and arts, to be able to discourse, to write, to paint, but principal as Plato holds your music, and so does wise Pythagoras, I take it. Is your true rapture when there is consent in a face, in voice and clothes, and is indeed our sex's chiefest ornament? The poet, as old in time as Plato, and as knowing, says that your highest female grace is silence. Which of your poets? Petrarch, or Tasso, or Dante? 
Guadi, Aristotle, Arentine, C.H.O. de Hadria. I have read them all. Volpone, aside. Is everything a cause to my destruction? I think I have two or three of them about me. Volpone, aside. The sun, the sea will sooner both stand still than her eternal tongue. Nothing can scape it. Here's Pastor Fido. Volpone, aside. Profess obstinate silence. That's now my safest. All our English writers, I mean such as are happy in the Italian, will deign to steal out of this author, mainly, almost as much as from Montaigne. He has so modern and facile a vein, fitting in the time and catching the court ear. Your Petrarch is more passionate, yet he in days of sonneting trusted them with much. Dante is hard and few can understand him, but for a desperate wit there's Arentine. Only his pictures are a little obscene. You mock me not. Alas, my mind is perturbed. Why in such cases must we cure ourselves, make use of our philosophy? Oh, me. And as we find our passions do rebel, encounter them with reason, or divert them, by getting scope unto some other humour, of lesser danger, as in politic bodies, there's nothing more doth overwhelm the judgment and cloud the understanding than too much settling and fixing, and, as twere, subsiding upon one object. For the incorporating of these same outward things into that part which we call mental leaves some certain faces that can stop the organs, and, as Plato says, assassinate our knowledge. Volpone, aside. Now the spirit of patience help me. Come in faith, I must visit you more days, and make you well laugh and be lusty. Volpone, aside. My good angel, save me! There was but one sole man in all the world with whom I e'er could sympathize, and he would lie, you, often three full hours together to hear me speak, and be sometimes so rapt, as he would answer me, quite from the purpose, like you, and you were like him, just. I'll discourse, and it be only, sir, to bring you asleep. How did we spend our time in love together for some six years? Oh, 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 oh! For we were continine, brought up. Some power, some fate, some fortune, rescue me! Enter Mosca. God save you, madam. Good sir. Mosca, welcome! <clears throat> welcome to my redemption! Why, sir? Oh, rid me of this, my torture, quickly there, my madam with the everlasting voice. The bells in time of pestilence ne'er made like noise, or were in that perpetual motion. The cockpit comes not near it. All my house, but now steamed like a bath with her thick breath. A lawyer could not have been heard nor scarce another woman such a hail of words she has let fall. For hell's sake, rid her hence. Has she presented? Oh, I do not care. I'll take her absence upon any price, with any loss. Madam? I have brought your patron a toy, a cap here, of my own work. Oh, Tis well. I had forgot to tell you I saw your knight, where you would little think it. Where? Marry, where, yet, if you make haste, you may apprehend rowing upon the water in a gondola with the most cunning courtesan of Venice. Is it true? Pursue them and believe your eyes. Leave me to make your gift. Exit Lady Politic, hastily. I knew twould take. For lightly they that use themselves most license are still most jealous. Mosca, hearty thanks for thy quick fiction and delivery of me. Now, to my hopes, what sayst thou? Re-enter Lady Politic would be. But do you hear, sir? Again? I fear a paroxysm. Which way row they together? Uh, toward the Rialto. I pray you lend me your dwarf. I pray you take him. Exit Lady Politic would be. Your hopes, sir, are like happy blossoms, fair and promise timely fruit, if you will stay but the maturing. Keep you at your couch. Corbaccio will arrive straight with the will. When he is gone, I'll tell you more. Exit. My blood, my spirits are returned. I am alive, and like your wanton gamester at Primero, whose thought had whispered to him, not go less, methinks I lie, 
and draw for an encounter. The scene closes upon Volpone. Scene 3. The passage leading to Volpone's chamber. Enter Mosca and Benario. Sir, here concealed, shows him a closet. Do you may hear all, but pray you, have patience, sir. Knocking within. Oh, the same's your father knocks. I am compelled to leave you. Exit. Do so. Yet cannot my thought imagine this a truth. Goes into the closet. Scene four. Another part of the same. Enter Mosca and Corvino, Celia following. Death on me! You were come too soon. What meant you? Did I not say I would send? Yes, but I feared you might forget it, and then they prevent us. Mosca, aside. Prevent? Did e'er man haste so for his horns? A courtier would not ply it so for a place. Well, now there's no helping it. Stay here. I'll presently return. Exit. Where are you, Celia? You know not wherefore I have brought you hither? Not well, except you told me. Now I will. Hark hither. Exeunt. Scene five. A closet opening into a gallery. Enter Mosca and Benario. Sir, your father hath sent word. It'll be half an hour ere he come. And therefore, if it please you to walk the while into that gallery at the upper end, there are some books to entertain the time. And I'll take care no man shall come unto you, sir. Yes, I will stay there. Aside. I do doubt this fellow. Exit. Mosca looking after him. There, he is far enough. He can hear nothing. And for his father, I can keep him off. Exit. Scene six. Volpone's chamber. Volpone on his couch. Mosca sitting by him. Enter Corvino, forcing in Celia. Nay, now there is no starting back, and therefore resolve upon it. I have so decreed. It must be done. Nor would I move it afore, because I would avoid all shifts and tricks that might deny me. Sir, let me beseech you, affect not these strange trials. If you doubt my chastity, why, lock me up for ever, make me the heir of darkness, let me live where I may please your fears, if not your trust. Believe it, I have no such humour, I. All that I speak I mean, yet I'm not mad, nor horn-mad, see you? Go to, show yourself obedient, and a wife. Oh, heaven! I say it, do so. What's this, the train? I've told you reasons that the physicians have set down, how much it may concern me, what my engagements are, my means, and the necessity of those means for my recovery. Wherefore, if you be loyal and mine, be one, respect my venture. Before your honour. Honour? Tut a breath. There's no such thing in nature, a mere term invented to all fools. What is my gold the worse for touching, clothes for being looked on? Why, this is no more. An old decrepit wretch that has no sense, no sinew, takes his meat with others' fingers, only knows to gape when you do scald his gums, a voice, a shadow, and what can this man hurt you? Celia, aside. Lord, what spirit is this hath entered him? And for your fame, that's such a jig, as if I would go tell it. Cry it on the piazza. Who shall know it, but he that cannot speak it, and this fellow whose lips are in my pocket? Save yourself, if you'll proclaim it you may. I know no other shall come to know it. Are oh, heaven and saints then nothing? Will they be blind or stupid? How? Good sir, be jealous still. Emulate them, and think what hate they burn with toward every sin. I grant you, if I thought it were a sin, I would not urge you. Should I offer this to some young Frenchman, or hot Tuscan blood that had read Aretine, conned all his prints, knew every quirk within lust's labyrinth, and were professed critic in lechery? And I would look upon him and applaud him. This were a sin. But here, tis contrary, a pious work, mere charity for physic, and honest polity to assure mine own. Oh, heaven! Canst thou suffer such a change? Thou art mine honour, Mosca, and my pride. My joy, my tickling, my delight. Go bring them. Mosca, advancing. Please you draw near, sir. Come on, what? You will not be rebellious by that light? Sir, Signor Corvino here is come to see you. Oh! And hearing of the consultation had, so lately for your health, has come to offer, or rather, sir, to prostitute. Thanks, sweet Mosca. Freely, unasked or unentreated. Well... As the true fervent instance of his love, his own most fair and proper wife, the beauty only of price in Venice. Tis well urged. To be your comfortress, and to preserve you. Alas, I am past already. 
pray you thank him for his good care and promptness. But for that, tis a vain labor e'en to fight against heaven, applying fire to stone. Uh, 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 uh. Making a dead leaf grow again. I take his wishes gently, though, and you may tell him what I have done for him. Mary, my state is hopeless. Will him to pray for me, and to use his fortune with reverence when he comes to it. Do you hear, sir? Go to him with your wife. Heart of my father, wilt thou persist thus? Come, I pray thee, come. Thou seest tis nothing, Celia. By this hand I shall grow violent. Come, do it, I say. Sir, kill me, rather. I will take down poison, eat burning coals, do anything. Be damned. Heart, I'll drag thee hence, home by the hair, cry thee a strumpet through the streets, rip up thy mouth unto thine ears, and slit thy nose like a raw rutchet. Do not tempt me. Come, yield, I am loath. Death, I will buy some slave whom I will kill, and bind thee to him alive, and at my window hang you forth, devising some monstrous crime which I in capital letters will eat into thy flesh with aqua fortis, and burning corrosives on the stubborn breast. Now, by the blood thou hast incensed, I'll do it. Sir, what you please you may. I am your martyr. Be not thus obstinate. I have not deserved it. Think who it is entreats you. Prithee, sweet, good faith. Thou shalt have jewels, gowns, attires, what thou wilt think and ask. Do but go kiss him or touch him, but for my sake, at my suit, this once. No, not I shall remember this. Will you disgrace me thus? Do you thirst my undoing? Nay, gentle lady, be advised. No, no, she has watched her time. Odds precious, this is scurvy, tis very scurvy, and you are... Nay, good sir. An arrant locust, by heaven a locust, whore, crocodile, that hast thy tears prepared, expecting how thou bid them flow. Nay, pray you, sir, she will consider. Would my life serve to satisfy? Sdeath, if she would but speak to him and save my reputation, it were somewhat, but spitefully to effect my utter ruin. Aye, now you have put your fortune in her hands. Why, your faith, it is her modesty. I must quit her. If you were absent, she would be more coming. I know it, and dare undertake for her. What woman can before her husband? Pray you, let us depart and leave her here. Sweet Celia, thou mayst redeem all yet. I'll say no more. If not, esteem yourself as lost. Nay, stay there. Shuts the door, and exit with Mosca. Oh, God and his good angels, whither, whither is shame fled human breasts, that with such ease men dare put off your honours and their own? Is that which ever was a cause of life now placed beneath the basest circumstance, and modesty and exile made for money? Ay, in Corvino, and such earth-fed minds. Leaping from his couch. That never tasted the true heaven of love. Assure thee, Celia, he that would sell thee only for hope of gain and that uncertain, he would have sold his part of paradise for ready money, had he met a cope man. Why art thou mazed to see me thus revived? Rather applaud thy beauty's miracle. Tis thy great work, that hath not now alone, but sundry times raised me in several shapes, and but this morning like a mountebank to see thee at thy window. I, before I would have left my practice for thy love, in varying figures, I would have contended with the blue Proteus, or the horned flood. Now art thou welcome. Sir! Nay, fly me not, nor let thy false imagination that I was bedrid make thee think I am so. Thou shalt not find it. I am now as fresh, as hot, as high, and in as jovial plight as when in that so celebrated scene at recitation of our comedy, for entertainment of the great Valois, I acted young Antinous, and attracted the eyes and ears of all the ladies present to admire such graceful gesture, note, and footing. Sings. Come, my Celia, let us prove, while we can, the sports of love. Time will not be ours for ever. He at length our good will sever. Spend not then his gifts in vain. Suns that set may rise again. But if once we lose this light, 
"'Tis with us perpetual night. "'Why should we defer our joys? "'Fame and rumour are but toys. "'Cannot we delude the eyes "'of a few poor household spies? "'Or his easier ears beguile, "'thus removed by our wile? "'Tis no sin love's fruits to steal, "'but the sweet thefts to reveal, "'to be taken, to be seen, these have crimes accounted been. Oh, some serene blast of your dire lightning strike this my offending face. Why droops my Celia? Thou hast, in place of a base husband, found a worthy lover. Use thy fortune well, with secrecy and pleasure. See, behold what thou art queen of. Not in expectation, as I feed others, but possessed and crowned. See here, a rope of pearl, and each more orient than that the brave Egyptian queen caroused. Dissolve and drink them. See, a carbuncle may put out both the eyes of our Saint Mark. A diamond would have brought Lolita Paulina when she came in like starlight, hid with jewels that were the spoils of provinces. Take these and wear and lose them? Yet remains an earring to purchase them again, and this whole state. A gem but worth a private patrimony is nothing. We will eat such at a meal. The heads of parrots, tongues of nightingales, the brains of peacocks and of estriches shall be our food. And could we get the phoenix, though nature lost her kind, she were our dish. Good sir, these things might move a mind affected with such delights, but I whose innocence is all I can think wealthy or worthy enjoying, and which once lost I have not to lose beyond it, cannot be taken with these sensual baits. If you have conscience... Tis the beggar's virtue. If thou hast wisdom, hear me, Celia. Thy baths shall be the juice of July flowers, spirit of roses and of violets, the milk of unicorns, and panther's breath gathered in bags and mixed with Cretan wines. Our drink shall be prepared gold and amber, which we will take until my roof whirl round with the vertigo. And my dwarf shall dance, my eunuch sing, my fool make up the antic. Whilst we, in changed shapes, act Ovid's tales, Thou like Europa now, and I like Jove, Then I like Mars, and thou like Erichine. So of the rest, till we have quite run through, And wearied all the fables of the gods. Then will I have thee in more modern forms, Attired like some sprightly dame of France, Brave Tuscan lady, or proud Spanish beauty, Sometimes unto the Persian Sophie's wife, Or the Grand Signor's mistress, And for change to one of our most artful courtesans, Or some quick negro or cold Russian. And I will meet thee in as many shapes, where we may so transfuse our wandering souls out at our lips and score up sums of pleasures. Sings. That the curious shall not know how to tell them as they flow, and the envious when they find what their number is be pined. If you have ears that will be pierced, or eyes that can be opened, a heart that may be touched, or any part that yet sounds man about you. If you have touch of holy saints or heaven, do me the grace to let me escape. If not, be bountiful and kill me. You do know I am a creature hither ill betrayed by one whose shame I would forget it were. If you will deign me neither of these graces, yet feed your wrath, sir, rather than your lust, it is a vice comes nearer manliness and punish that unhappy crime of nature which you must call my beauty. Flay my face, or poison it with ointments for seducing your blood to this rebellion. Rub these hands with what may cause an eating leprosy, even to my bones and marrow. Anything that may disfavour me, save in my honour, and I will kneel to you, pray for you, pay down a thousand hourly vows, sir, for your health, report and think you virtuous. Think me cold? 
frozen and impotent, and so report me? That I had Nestor's hernia, thou wouldst think. I do degenerate and abuse my nation to play with opportunity thus long. I should have done the act, and then have parlayed. Yield, or I'll force thee. Seizes her. Oh, just God! In vain! Benario, rushing in. Forbear, foul ravisher, libidinous swine! Free the forged lady, or thou diest, impostor! But that I'm loath to snatch thy punishment out of the hand of justice, thou shouldst yet be made the timely sacrifice of vengeance before this altar and this dross thy idol. Lady, let's quit the place. It is the den of villainy. Fear not, you have a guard, and he, ere long, shall meet his just reward. Exeunt, Benario and Celia. Fall on me, roof, and bury me in ruin. Become my grave that wert my shelter. Oh, I am unmasked, unspirited, undone, betrayed to beggary, to infamy. Enter Mosca, wounded and bleeding. Oh, where shall I run? Most wretched shame of men to beat out my unlucky brains. Here, here, what? Dost thou bleed? Oh, that his well-driven sword had been so courteous to have cleft me down unto the navel. Ere I live to see my life, my hopes, my spirits, my patron, all thus desperately engaged by my error. Woe on thy fortune! And my folly, sir. Thou hast made me miserable. And myself, sir. Who would have thought he would have hearkened so? What shall we do? I know not. If my heart could expiate the mischance, I'd pluck it out. Will you be pleased to hang me, or cut my throat? And I'll requite you, sir. Let us die like Romans, since we have lived like Grecians. Knocking within. Hark! Who's there? I hear some footing. Officers, the Safi, come to apprehend us. I do feel the brand hissing already at my forehead. Now mine ears are boring. To your couch, sir. You make that place good, however. Volpone lies down as before. Guilty men suspect what they deserve still. Enter Corbaccio. Signor Corbaccio? Why? How now, Mosca? Oh, undone. Amazed, sir. Your son, I know not by what accident, acquainted with your purpose to my patron, touching your will and making him your heir, entered our house with violence, his sword drawn, sought for you, called you wretch, unnatural, vowed he would kill you. Me? Yes, and my patron. This act shall disinherit him indeed. Here is the will. Tis well, sir. Right and well. Be you as careful now for me. Enter Voltore, behind. My life, sir, is not more tended. I am only yours. How does he? Will he die shortly, thinks thou? I fear he'll outlast May. Today? No, last out May, sir. Couldst thou not give him a dram? Oh, by no means, sir. Nay, I'll not bid you. Voltore, coming forward. This is a knave, I see. Masca, seeing Voltore. How, Signor Voltore? Aside, did he hear me? Parasite! Who's that? Oh, sir, most timely welcome. Scarce to the discovery of your tricks, I fear. You are his only, and mine also, are you not? Who? I, sir? You, sir. What device is this about a will? A plot for you, sir. Come, put not your foists upon me. I shall send them. Did you not hear it? Yes, I hear Corbaccio hath made your patron there his heir. Tis true, by my device, drawn to it by my plot with hope. Your patron should reciprocate? And you have promised? For your good I did, sir. Nay more, I told his son, brought, hid him here, where he might hear his father pass the deed, being persuaded to it by this thought, sir, that the unnaturalness first of the act, and then his father's oft disclaiming in him, which I did mean to help on, would sure enrage him to do some violence upon his parent, on which the law should take sufficient hold, and you be stated in a double hope. Truth be my comfort and my conscience. My only aim was to dig you a fortune out of these two old rotten sepulchres. I cry thee mercy, Mosca. Worth your patience and your great merit, sir. And see the change. Why, what success? Most hapless. 
you must help, sir. Whilst we expected the old raven, in comes Corvino's wife, sent hither by her husband. What, with a present? No, sir, on visitation. I'll tell you how anon. And staying long, the youth he grows impatient, rushes forth, seizeth the lady, wounds me, makes her swear, or he would murder her, that was his vow, to affirm my patron to have done her rape, which how unlike it is, you see, and hence with that pretext he's gone to accuse his father, defame my patron, defeat you. Where is her husband? Let him be sent for straight. Sir, I'll go fetch him. Bring him to the scrutineo. Sir, I will. This must be stopped. Oh, you do nobly, sir. Alas, t'was laboured all, sir, for your good, nor was there want of counsel in the plot. But fortune can at any time all throw the projects of a hundred learned clerks, sir. Corbaccio, listening. What's that? Wilt please you, sir, to go along. Exit Corbaccio, followed by Voltore. Patron, go in, and pray for our success. Volpone rising from his couch. Need makes devotion. Heaven your labor bless. Exeunt. End of Act Three. Act Four. Scene One. A street. Enter Sir Politic Woodby and Peregrine. I told you, sir, it was a plot. You see what observation is? You mentioned me for some instructions. I will tell you, sir. Since we are met here in this height of Venice, some few particulars I have set down, only for this meridian fit to be known of your crude traveller, and they are these. I will not touch, sir, at your phrase or close, for they are old. Sir, I have better. Pardon, I meant as they are themes. Oh, sir, proceed. I'll slander you no more of wit, good sir. First, for your garb. It must be grave and serious, very reserved and locked. Not tell a secret on any terms, not to your father. Scarce a fable, but with caution. Make sure choice both of your company and discourse. Beware you never speak a truth. How? Not to strangers, for those be they you must converse with most. Others I would not know, sir, but at a distance so as i still might be a saver in them you shall have tricks else passed upon you hourly and then for your religion profess none but wonder at the diversity of all and for your part protest were there no other but simply the laws of the land you could content you nicolai machiavelli and m bowden both were of this mind then must you learn the use and handling of your silver fork at meals, the metal of your glass. These are main matters with your Italian, and to know the hour when you must eat your melons and your figs. Is that a point of state, too? Here it is. For your Venetian, if he see a man preposterous in the least, he has him straight, he has, he strips him. I'll acquaint you, sir, I now have lived here, tis some fourteen months, within the first week of my landing here, all took me for a citizen of Venice. I knew the form so well. Peregrine, aside. And nothing else. I had read Contarene, took me a house, dealt with my Jews to furnish it with movables. Well, if I could but find one man, one man to mine own heart, whom I durst trust, I would. What? What, sir? Make him rich. Make him a fortune. He should not think again. I would command it. As how? With certain projects that I have, which I may not discover. Peregrine, aside. If I had but one to wager with, I would lay odds now, he tells me instantly. One is, and that I care not greatly who knows, to serve the state of Venice with red herrings for three years. And at a certain rate, from Rotterdam, where I have correspondence. There's a letter sent me from one of the states, and to that purpose. He cannot write his name, but that's his mark. He's a chandler? No, a cheesemonger. There are some others, too, with whom I treat about the same negotiation. And I will undertake it, for tis thus. I'll do it with ease. I have cast it all. Your hoy carries but three men in her, and a boy, and she shall make me three returns a year, 
So, if there come but one of three, I save. If two, I can default. But this is now if my main project fail. Then you have others. I should be loath to draw the subtle air of such a place without my thousand aims. I'll not dissemble, sir. Where'er I come, I love to be considerative. And tis true I have at my free hours thought upon some certain goods unto the state of Venice, which I do call my cautions. And, sir, which I mean in hopes of pension, to propound to the great council, then unto the forty, so to the ten. My means are made already. By whom? Sir, one that, though his place be obscure, yet he can sway, and they will hear him. He's a commendador. What, a common sergeant? Sir, such as they are, put it in their mouths what they should say sometimes. And well as greater, I think I have my notes to show you. Searching his pockets. Good sir. But you shall swear unto me, on your gentry, not to anticipate. I, sir. Nor reveal a circumstance. My paper is not with me. Oh, but you can remember, sir. My first is concerning tinder-boxes. You must know no family is here without its box. Now, sir, it being so portable a thing, put case that you or I were ill-affected unto the state, sir. With it in our pockets, might not I go into the arsenal, or you come out again, and none the wiser? Except yourself, sir. Go to, then. I therefore advertised to the state how fit it were that none but such as were known patriots, sound lovers of their country, should be suffered to enjoy them in their houses, and even those sealed at some office, and at such a bigness as might not lurk in pockets. Admirable. My next is how to inquire and be resolved by present demonstration, whether a ship newly arrived from Soria, or from any suspected part of all the Levant, be guilty of the plague, and where they used to lie out forty, fifty days sometimes, about the Lazzetto for their trial, I'll save that charge and loss unto the merchant, and in an hour clear the doubt. Indeed, sir. Or I will lose my labor. My faith, that's much. Nay, sir, conceive me. It will cost me in onions some thirty livres. Which is one pound sterling. Beside my waterworks, for this I do, sir. First, I bring in your ship twixt two brick walls, but those the state shall venture. On the one I strain me a fair tarpaulin, and in that I stick my onions cut in halves. The other is full of loopholes, out at which I thrust the noses of my bellows, and those bellows I keep, with waterworks, in perpetual motion, which is the easiest matter of a hundred. Now, sir, your onion, which does naturally attract the infection, and your bellows blowing the air upon him, will show instantly by his changed color if there be contagion, or else remain as fair as at the first. Now it is known. Tis nothing. You are right, sir. I would I had my note. Faith, so would I. But you have done well for once, sir. Were I false, or would be made so, I could show you reasons how I could sell this state now to the Turk spite of their galleys or their examining his papers pray you sir paul i have them not about me that i feared they are there sir no this is my diary wherein i note my actions of the day pray you let's see sir what is here reads no tandem a rad had known my spur leathers notwithstanding i put on new and did go forth but first i threw three beans over the threshold item I went and bought two toothpicks, whereof one I burst immediately in a discourse with a Dutch merchant, Bado Radion del Stato. From him I went and paid a mochinigo for pacing my silk stockings. By the way, I cheapened sprats, and at St. Mark's I urined. Faith, these are politic notes. Sir, I do slip no action of my life, but thus I quote it. Believe me, it is wise. Nay, sir, read forth. Enter at a distance Lady Politic Woodby, Nano, and two waiting women. Where should this loose knight be, Trow? Sure he's housed. Why, then he's fast. Ay, he plays both with me. I pray you stay. 
This heat will do more harm to my complexion than his heart is worth. I do not care to hinder but to take him. Rubbing her cheeks. How it comes off! My master's yonder. Where? With a young gentleman. That same to the party in man's apparel. Pray you, sir, jog my knight. I'll be tender to his reputation, however he demerit. Sir Politic, seeing her. My lady. Where? Tis she indeed, sir. You shall know her. She is, were she not mine, a lady of that merit for fashion and behaviour, and for beauty I durst compare. It seems you are not jealous that dare commend her. Nay, and for discourse. Being your wife, she cannot miss that. Sir Politic, introducing Peregrine. Madam, here is a gentleman. Pray you use him fairly. He seems a youth, but he is... None. Yes, one has put his face as soon into the world. You mean as early, but today? How's this? Why in this habit, sir, you apprehend me? Well, Master Woodby, this doth not become you. I had thought the odour, sir, of your name had been more precious to you that you would not have done this dire massacre on your honour, one of your gravity and rank besides. But knights, I see, care little for the oath. They make two ladies chiefly their own ladies. Now by my spurs, the symbol of my knighthood. Peregrine, aside. Lord, how his brain is humbled for an oath. I reach you not. Right, sir, your policy... May it bear through thus. To Peregrine. Sir, a word with you. I would be loth to contest publicly with any gentlewoman, or to be seen forward, or violent, as the courtier says. It comes too near rusticity in a lady, which I would shun by all means, and, however, I may deserve from Master Woodby yet, to have, when fair gentlewoman must be made, the unkind instrument to wrong another and one she knows not, I, and to persevere in my poor judgment is not warranted from being a solecism in our sex, if not in manners. How is this? Sweet madam, come nearer to your aim. Mary, and will, sir, since you provoke me with your impudence and laughter of your light land siren here, your sporus, your homphrodite. What's here? Pratic fury and historic storms? The gentleman, believe it, is of worth and of our nation. Ay, uh, your white friar's nation, come, I blush for you, Master Woodby. I and am ashamed that you should have no more forehead than thus to be the patron or St. George, to a lewd harlot, a base fricatress, a female devil in a male outside. Nay, and you be such a one? I must bid adieu to your delights. The case appears too liquid. Exit. Ah, you may carry it clear, with your state face, but for your carnival complacence. Who here is fled for liberty of conscience, from furious persecution of the marshal? Her will I display. This is fine, in faith. And do you use this often? Is this part of your wit's exercise against you have occasion, madam? Go to, sir. Do you hear me, lady? Why, if your knight have set you to beg shirts, or to invite me home, you might have done it a nearer way by far. This cannot work you out of my snare. Why, am I in it, then? Indeed, your husband told me you were fair, and so you are. Only your nose inclines, that side that's next the sun, to the queen apple. This cannot be endured by any patience. Enter Mosca. What is the matter, madam? If the Senate write not my quest in this, I'll protest them to all the world no aristocracy. What is the injury, lady? Why, the colour you told me of, here I have ten disguised. Who? This? What means your ladyship? The creature I mentioned to you is apprehended now before the Senate. You shall see her. Where? I'll bring you to her. This young gentleman, I saw him land this morning at the port. Is it possible? How has my judgment wondered, sir? I must be blushing, say to you. I have erred and plead your pardon. What? More changes yet? I hope you have not the malice to remember a gentleman's passion. 
If you stay in Venice here, please you to use me, sir. Will you go, madam? Pray you, sir, use me. In faith, the more you see me, the more I shall conceive you have forgot our quarrel. Exeunt Lady Woodby, Mosca, Nono, and Waiting Women. This is rare. Sir Politic Woodby? No, Sir Politic Bawd. To bring me thus acquainted with his wife? Well, why, Sir Paul, since you have practised thus upon my freshmanship, I'll try your salt head, what proof it is against a counterplot. Exit. Scene two. The Scrutineo, or Senate House. Enter Voltore, Corbaccio, Corvino, and Mosca. Well, now you know the carriage of the business, your constancy is all that is required unto the safety of it. Is the lie safely conveyed amongst us? Is that sure? Knows every man his burden? Yes. Then shrink not. But knows the advocate the truth? Oh, sir, by no means. I devised a formal tale that salved a reputation. But be valiant, sir. I fear no one but him, that this his pleading should make him stand for a co-heir. Co-halter? Hang him. We will but use his tongue, his noise, as we do croakers here. Aye, what shall he do? When we have done, you mean? Yes. Why, we'll think. Sell him for mummia. He's half dust already. To Voltore. Do not you smile to see this buffalo, how he does sport it with his head? Aside, I should, if it were all well and past. To Corbaccio. Sir, only you are he that shall enjoy the crop of all, and these not know for whom they toil. Aye, peace. Mosca, turning to Corvino. But you shall eat it. Aside. Much. To Voltore. Worshipful, sir. Mercury sit upon your thundering tongue, or the French Hercules, and make your language as conquering as his club, to beat along, as with a tempest, flat our adversaries. But much more yours, sir. Here they come. Have done. I have another witness, if you need, sir, I can produce. Who is it? Sir, I have her. Enter Avocatori and take their seats. Benario, Celia, Notario, Commandadori, Safi, and other officers of justice. The like of this the Senate never heard of. It will come most strange to them when we report it. The gentlewoman has been ever held of unreproved name. So has the youth. The more unnatural part of his father. More of the husband. I not know to give his act a name, it is so monstrous. But the impostor, he's a thing created to exceed example. And all the after-times. I never heard a true voluptuary described but him. Appear yet those were cited. All but the old Magnifico Volpone. Why is not he here? Please, your fatherhoods, here is his advocate, himself so weak, so feeble. What are you? His parasite, his knave, his pandar. I beseech the court he may be forced to come that your grave eyes may bear strong witness of his strange impostures. Upon my faith and credit with your virtues, he is not able to endure the air. Bring him, however. We will see him. Fetch him. Your fatherhood's fit pleasures be obeyed. Exeunt officers. But sure, the sight will rather move your pities than indignation. May it please the court, in the meantime, he may be heard in me. I know this place most void of prejudice, and therefore crave it, since we have no reason to fear our truth should hurt our cause. Speak free. Then no, most honoured fathers, I must now discover to your strangely abused ears the most prodigious and most frontless piece of solid impudence and treachery that ever vicious nature yet brought forth to shame the state of Venice. This lewd woman, that wants no artificial looks or tears to help the visor she has now put on, hath long been known a close adulteress to that lascivious youth there. Not suspected, I say, but known, and taken in the act with him. And by this man, the easy husband, pardoned, whose timeless bounty makes him now stand here, 
the most unhappy innocent person that ever man's own goodness made accused for these not knowing how to owe a gift of that dear grace but with their shame being placed so above all powers of their gratitude began to hate the benefit and in place of thanks devise to extirp the memory of such an act wherein i pray your fatherhoods to observe the malice yea the rage of creatures discovered in their evils and what heart such take even from their crimes but that anon will more appear this gentleman the father hearing of this foul fact with many others which daily struck to his too tender ears and grieved in nothing more than that he could not preserve himself a parent his son's ills growing to that strange flood at last decreed to disinherit him these be strange turns the young man's fame was ever fair and honest so much more full of danger is his vice that can beguile so under shade of virtue but as i said my honoured sires his father having this settled purpose by what means to him betrayed we know not and this day appointed for the deed that parricide i cannot style him better by confederacy preparing this his paramour to be there entered volpone's house who was the man your fatherhoods must understand designed for the inheritance there sought his father but with what purpose sought he him my lords i tremble to pronounce it that a son unto a father and to such a father should have so foul felonious intent it was to murder him when being prevented by his more happy absence what then did he not check his wicked thoughts no now new deeds mischief doth ever end where it begins an act of horror fathers he dragged forth the aged gentleman that had there lain bedrid three years and more out of his innocent couch naked upon the floor there left him wounded his servant in the face and with this strumpet the stale to his forged practice who was glad to be so active i shall here desire your fatherhoods to note but my recollections as most remarkable thought at once to stop his father's ends discredit his free choice in the old gentleman redeem themselves by laying infamy upon this man to whom with blushing they should owe their lives what proofs have you of this most honoured fathers i humbly crave there be no credit given to this man's mercenary tongue forbear his soul moves in his fee oh sir this fellow for six souls more would plead against his maker you do forget yourself nay nay grave fathers let him have scope can any man imagine that he will spare his accuser that would not have spared his parent well produce your proofs i would i could forget i were a creature signor corbaccio corbaccio comes forward what is he the father has he had an oath yes what must i do now your testimony's craved speak to the knave i'll have my mouth first stopped with earth my heart abhors his knowledge i disclaim in him but for what cause the mere portent of nature he is an utter stranger to my loins have they made you to this i will not hear thee monster of men swine goat wolf parricide speak not thou viper sir i will sit down 
and rather wish my innocence should suffer than I resist the authority of a father. Signor Corvino. Corvino comes forward. This is strange. Who's this? The husband. Is he sworn? He is. Speak, then. This woman please your fatherhoods is a whore of most hot exercise, more than a partridge, upon record. No more. Nays like a genet. Preserve the honour of the court. I shall, and modesty of your most reverend ears, and yet I hope that I may say these eyes have seen her glued unto that piece of cedar, that fine well-timbered gallant, and that here the letters may be read through the horn that make the story perfect. Excellent, sir. Corvino, aside to Mosca. There's no shame in this now, is there? None. Or if I said I hope that she were onward to her damnation, if there be a hell greater than whore and woman, a good Catholic may make the doubt. His grief hath made him frantic. Remove him hence. Look to the woman. Celia swoons. Rare, prettily feigned again. Stand from her border. Give her the air. Third avocatore to Mosca. What can you say? My wound, may it please your wisdoms, speaks for me, received in aid of my good patron. When he missed his sought-for father, when that well-taught dame had her cue given her to cry out a rape. Oh, most late impudence! Fathers! Sir, be silent. You had your hearing free, so must they theirs. I do begin to doubt the imposture here. This woman has too many moods. Brave fathers, she is a creature of a most professed and prostituted lewdness. Most impetuous, unsatisfied grave fathers. May her feignings not take your wisdoms. But this day she baited a stranger, a grave knight, with her loose eyes and more lascivious kisses. This man saw them together on the water in a gondola. Here is the lady herself that saw them too, without, who then had in the open streets pursued them, but for saving her knight's honour. Produce that lady. Let her come. Exit Mosca. These things, they strike with wonder. I am turned a stone. Re-enter Mosca with Lady Woodby. Be resolute, madam. I, this same as she. Pointing to Celia. Out, thou shamlon harlot! Now thine eyes vie with tears with the hyena. Does thou look upon my wronged face? I cry your pardons, I fear. I have forgettingly transgressed against the dignity of the court. No, madam. And have been exorbitant. You have not, lady. These proofs are strong. Surely I had no purpose to scandalize your honours or my sexes. We do believe it. Surely you may believe it. Madam, we do. Indeed you may, my breeding is not so coarse. We know it. To offend with pertinency. Lady. Such a presence, no surely. We well think it. You may think it. Let her overcome. What witnesses have you to make good your report? Our consciences. And heaven, that never fails the innocent. These are no testimonies. Not in your courts, where multitude and clamour overcomes. Nay, then you do wax insolent. Re-enter officers, bearing Volpone on a couch. Here, here the testimony comes that will convince, and put to utter dumbness their bold tongues. See here, grave fathers, Here's the ravisher, the rider on men's wives, the great impostor, the grand voluptuary. Do you not think these limbs should affect venery, or these eyes cover a concubine? Pray you, mark these hands. Are they not fit to stroke a lady's breasts? Perhaps he doth dissemble. So he does. Would you have him tortured? I would have him proved. Ah, best try him then with goads or burning irons. Put him to the strapado. I have heard the rack hath cured the gout. 
faith give it him and help him of a malady be courteous i'll undertake before these honoured fathers he shall have yet as many left diseases as she has known adulterers or thou strumpets oh my most equal hearers if these deeds acts of this bold and most exorbitant strain may pass with sufferance what one citizen but owes the forfeit of his life yea fame to him that dares traduce him which of you are safe my honoured fathers i would ask with leave of your grave fatherhoods if their plot have any face or colour like to truth or if unto the dullest nostril here it smell not rank and most abhorred slander i crave your care of this good gentleman whose life is much endangered by their fable and as for them i will conclude with this that vicious persons when they are hot and fleshed in impious acts their constancy abounds damned deeds are done with greatest confidence take them to custody and sever them tis pity two such prodigies should live let the old gentleman be returned with care exeunt officers with volpone i'm sorry our credulity hath wronged him these are two creatures i've an earthquake in me their shame even in their cradles fled their faces fourth avocatore to voltore you have done a worthy service to the state sir in their discovery you shall hear ere night what punishment the court decrees upon them exeunt avocatori notario and officers with benario and celia we thank your fatherhoods how like you it rare i'd have your tongue sir tipped with gold for this i'd have you be the heir to the whole city the earth i'd have want men ere you want living they're bound to erect your statue in st mark's signor corvino i would have you go and show yourself that you have conquered yes it was much better that you should profess yourself a cuckold thus than that the other should have been proved nay i considered that now it is her fault then it had been yours true i do doubt this advocate still if faith you need not i dare ease you of that care i trust thee mosca exit as your own soul sir mosca now for your business sir how have you business yes yours sir oh none else none else not i be careful then rest you with both your eyes sir dispatch it instantly and look that all whatever be put in jewels plate monies household stuff bedding curtains curtain rings sir only the advocate's fee must be deducted i'll pay him now you'll be too prodigal sir i must tender it two check wines as well no six sir tis too much he talked a great while you must consider that sir well there's three i'll give it him do so and there's for thee exit masca aside bountiful bones what horrid strange offence did he commit against nature in his youth worthy this age to voltore you see sir how i work into your ends take you no notice no i'll leave you exit all is yours the devil and all good advocate madam i'll bring you home no i'll go see your patron that you shall not i'll tell you why my purpose is to urge my patron to reform his will and for the zeal you have shown to-day whereas before you were but third or fourth you shall be now put in the first which would appear as begged if you were present therefore you shall sway me exeunt end of act four act five scene one a room in volpone's house enter volpone well i am here and all this brunt is past i ne'er was in dislike with my disguise till this fled moment here twas good and private 
but in your public cave whilst I breathe. For God, my left leg began to have the cramp, and I apprehended straight some power had struck me with a dead palsy. Well, I must be merry and shake it off. A many of these fears would put me into some villainous disease should they come thick upon me. I'll prevent them. Give me a bowl of lusty wine to fright this humor from my heart. Drinks. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Tis almost gone already. I shall conquer. Any device now of rare ingenious knavery that would possess me with a violent laughter would make me up again. Drinks again. So, 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 so. This heat is life. Tis blood by this time. Mosca! Enter Mosca. How now, sir? Does the day look clear again? Are we recovered and wrought out of error, into our way to see our path before us? Is our trade free once more? Exquisite Mosca! Was it not carried learnedly? And stoutly. Good wits are greatest in extremities. It were a folly beyond thought to trust any grand act unto a cowardly spirit. You were not taken within enough, methinks. Oh, more than if I had enjoyed the wench. The pleasure of all womankind's not like it. Why, now you speak, sir. We must here be fixed. Here we must rest. This is our masterpiece. We cannot think to go beyond this. True. Thou hast played thy prize, my precious Mosca. Nay, sir, to gull the court. And quite divert the torrent upon the innocent? Yes, and to make so rare a music out of discords. Right. That yet to me's the strangest how thou hast borne it, that these, being so divided amongst themselves, should not scent somewhat, or in me or thee, or doubt their own side. True, they will not see it. Too much light blinds them, I think. Each of them is so possessed and stuffed with his own hopes that anything unto the contrary, never so true or never so apparent, never so palpable, they will resist it. Like a temptation of the devil! Right, sir. Merchants may talk of trade, and your great signors of land that yields well, but if Italy have any glebe more fruitful than these fellows, I am deceived. Did not your advocate rare? Oh, <laughs> my most honoured fathers, my grave fathers, under correction of your fatherhoods, what face of truth is here? If these strange deeds may pass, most honoured fathers, <laughs> I had much ado to forbear laughing. It seemed to me you swept, sir. In troth, I did a little. But confess, sir, were you not daunted? In good faith, I was a little in a mist, but not dejected. Never, but still myself. I think it, sir. Now, so truth help me, I must needs say this, sir, and out of conscience for your advocate. He has taken pains, in faith, sir, and deserved, in my poor judgment, I speak it under favour, not to contrary you, sir, very richly. Well, to be cousined. Troth, and I think so too, by that I heard him in the latter end. Oh, but before, sir, had you heard him first draw it to certain heads, then aggravate, then use his vehement figures, I looked still when he would shift a shirt, and doing this out of pure love, no hope of gain. Tis right. I cannot answer him, Mosca, as I would, not yet. But for thy sake, at thy entreaty, I will begin even now to vex them all this very instant. Good, sir. Call the dwarf and eunuch forth. Castrone, Nano. Enter Castrone and Nano. Here. Shall we have a jig now? What you please, sir. Go, straight give out about the streets, you two, that I am dead. Do it with constancy. Sadly, do you hear? Imputed to the grief of this late slander. Exeunt Castrone and Nano. What do you mean, sir? Oh, I shall have instantly my vulture, crow, raven come flying hither on the news to peck for carrion, my she-wolf and all, greedy and full of expectation. And then to have it ravished from their mouths. Tis true. I will have thee put on a gown and take upon thee as thou wert mine heir. Shew them a will. Open that chest and reach forth one of those that has the blanks. I'll straight put in thy name. Mosca gives him a paper. It will be rare, sir. Aye, 
when they even gape and find themselves deluded? Yes. And thou use them scurvily. Dispatch, get on thy gown. Masca putting on a gown. But what, sir, if they ask after the body? Say it was corrupted. I'll say it stunk, sir, and was fain to have it coffined up instantly and sent away. Anything, what thou wilt. Hold, here's my will. Get thee a cap, a count book, pen and ink, papers afore thee. Sit as thou wert taking an inventory of parcels. I'll get up behind the curtain on a stool and hearken. Sometime peep over, see how they do look, with what degrees their blood doth leave their faces. <laughs> oh, twill afford me a rare meal of laughter. Mosca, putting on a cap and setting out the table, etc. Your advocate will turn stark dull upon it. It will take off his oratory's edge. But your clarissimo, old round-back, he will crump you like a hog-louse with the touch. And what Corvino? Oh, sir, look for him to-morrow morning with a rope and dagger to visit all the streets. He must run mad. My lady, too, that came into the court to bear false witness for your worship. Yes, and kissed me for the fathers when my face flowed all with oils. And sweat, sir. Why, your gold is such another medicine, it dries up all those offensive savours. It transforms the most deformed and restores them lovely, as twere the strange poetical girdle. Jove could not invent to himself a shroud more subtle to pass Acrisius's guards. It is the thing makes all the world her grace, her youth, her beauty. I think she loves me. Who? The lady, sir. She's jealous of you. Dost thou say so? Knocking within. Hark, there's some already. Look. It is the vulture. He has the quickest scent. I'll to my place, thou to thy posture. Goes behind the curtain. I am set. But, Mosca, play the artificer now. Torture them rarely. Enter Voltore. How now, my Mosca? Mosca, writing. Turkey carpets, nine. Taking an inventory. That is well. Two suits of bedding, tissue. Where's the will? Let me read that the while. Enter servants with Corbaccio in a chair. So, set me down, and get you home. Exeunt servants. Is he come now to trouble us? Of cloth of gold, two more. Is it done, Mosca? Of several velvets, eight. I like his care. Dost thou not hear? Enter Corvino. Ha! Huh. Is the hour come, Mosca? Volpone, peeping over the curtain. Ay, now they muster. What does this advocate here, or this Corbaccio? What do these here? Enter Lady Politic would be. Mosca, is his thread spun? Eight chests of linen. Oh, my fine dame would be too. Mosca, the will, that I may show it these and rid them hence. Six chests of diaper, four of damask. There. Gives them the will carelessly over his shoulder. Is that the will? Down beds and bolsters. Rare. Be busy still. Now they begin to flutter. They never think of me. Look, see, see, see! How their swift eyes run over the long deed, unto the name and to the legacies what is bequeathed them there. Ten suits of hangings. Ay, in their garters, Mosca. Now their hopes are at the gasp. Mosca, the heir? What's that? My advocate is dumb. Look to my merchant. He has heard of some strange storm. A ship is lost. He faints. My lady will swoon. Old glazen eyes, he hath not reached his despair yet. Corbaccio takes the will. All these are out of hope. I am sure the man. But Mosca. Two cabinets. Is this in earnest? One of ebony. Or do you but delude me? The other mother of pearl. I am very busy. Good faith, it is a fortune thrown upon me. Item, one salt of agate. Not my seeking. 
do hear, sir? A perfumed box. Pray you forbear, you see I'm troubled. Made of an onyx. How? Tomorrow, or next day, I shall be at leisure to talk with you all. Is this my large hope's issue? Sir, I must have a fairer answer. Madam, marry and shall. Pray you fairly quit my house. Nay, raise no tempest with your looks. But hark you, remember what your ladyship offered me to put you in an air. Go to, think on it. And what you said he and your best madams did for maintenance. And why not you? Enough. Go home and use the poor Sir Paul your knight well, for fear I tell some riddles. Go, be melancholy. Exit Lady Woodby. Oh, my fine devil. Mosca, pray you a word. Lord, will you not take your dispatch hence yet? Methinks of all you should have been the example. Why should you stay here? With what thought, what promise? Hear you. Do not you know? I know you an ass, and that you would most fain have been a whittle, if fortune would have let you. That you are a declared cuckold on good terms. This pearl, you'll say, was yours? Right, this diamond? I'll not deny it, but thank you. Much here else, it may be so. Why think that these good works may help to hide your bad? I'll not betray you, although you be but extraordinary, and have it only in title it sufficeth. Go home, be melancholy too, or mad. Exit Corvino. Rare Mosca! How his villainy becomes him! Certain he doth delude all these for me. Mosca the heir? Oh, his four eyes have found it. I am cousined, cheated by a parasite slave. Harlot, thou hast gulled me. Yes, sir, stoop your mouth, or I shall draw the only tooth is left. Are not you he, that filthy, covetous wretch, with the three legs, that here in hope of prey have any time this three years snuffed about with your most grovelling nose, and would have hired me to the poisoning of my patron, sir? Are not you he that have to-day in court professed the disinheriting of your son, perjured yourself? Go home, and die, and stink. If you but croak a syllable, it all comes out. Away, and call your porters. Exit Corbaccio. Go, go. Stink. Excellent varlet. Now, my faithful Mosca, I find thy constancy. Sir? Sincere. Mosca, writing. The table of porphyry. I ma you'll be thus troublesome. Nay, leave off now, they're gone. Why, who are you? What, who did send for you? Oh, cry you mercy, reverend sir, good faith, I am grieved for you, that any chance of mine should thus defeat your, I must need say, most deserving travails. But I protest, sir, it was cast upon me, and I could almost wish to be without it, but that the will of the dead must be observed. Marry, my joy is that you need it not. You have a gift, sir, thank your education, will never let you want, or there are men and malice to breed causes. Would I had but half the like for all my fortune, sir. If I have any suits, as I do hope, things being so easy and direct, I shall not, I will make bold with your obstreperous aid. Conceive me, for your fee, sir. In meantime, you that have so much law, I know, have the conscience not to be covetous of what is mine. Good sir, I thank you for my plate. Twill help to set up a young man. Good faith, you look as you were costive. Best go home and purge, sir. Exit Voltore. Vopone comes from behind the curtain. Bid him eat lettuce well. <laughs> My witty mischief, let me embrace thee. Oh, that I could now transform thee to a Venus. Mosca, go, straight take my habit of clarissimo, and walk the streets. Be seen, torment them more. We must pursue as well as plot. Who would have lost this feast? I doubt it will lose them. Oh, my recovery shall recover all. That I could now but think on some disguise to meet them in and ask them questions, how I would vex them still at every turn. 
so I can fit you. Canst thou? Yes, I know one of the commandadori, sir, so like you. Him will I straight make drunk and bring you his habit. A rare disguise and answering thy brain. Oh, I will be a sharp disease unto them. Sir, you must look for curses. Till they burst. The fox fares ever best when he is cursed. Exeunt. Scene two. A hall in Sir Politic's house. Enter Peregrine disguised and three merchants. Am I enough disguised? I warrant you. All my ambition is to fright him only. If you could ship him away, twere excellent. To Zant or to Aleppo? Yes, and have his adventures put in the book of voyages, and his gold story registered for truth. Well, gentlemen, when I am in a while, and that you think us warm in our discourse, know your approaches. Trust it to our care. Exeunt merchants. Enter waiting woman. Save you, fair lady, is Sir Paul within? I do not know, sir. Pray you say unto him, here is a merchant upon earnest business desires to speak with him. I will see, sir. Exit. Pray you, I see the family is all female here. Re-enter waiting woman. He says, sir, he has weighty affairs of state that now require him whole. Some other time you may possess him. Pray you say again, if those require him whole, these will exact him whereof I bring him tidings. Exit woman. What might be his grave affair of state now? How to make Bolognian sausages here in Venice, sparing one of the ingredients? Re-enter waiting woman. Sir, he says he knows by your word tidings that you are no statesman, and therefore wills you to stay. Sweet, pray you return him. I have not read so many proclamations and studied them for words as he has done, but here he deigns to come. Exit woman. Enter Sir Politic. Sir, I must crave your courteous pardon. There hath chanced today unkind disaster twixt my lady and me, and I was penning my apology to give her satisfaction, as you came now. Sir, I am grieved I bring you worse disaster. The gentleman you met at the port today that told you he is newly arrived. I was a fugitive punk? No, sir, a spy is set on you. And he has made relation to the Senate that you professed to him to have a plot to sell the state of Venice to the Turk. Oh, me! For which warrants are signed by this time to apprehend you and to search your study for papers. Alas, sir! I have none, but notes drawn out of playbooks. All the better, sir. And some essays. What shall I do? Sir, best convey yourself into a sugar chest, or if you could lie round, a frail were rare, and I could send you aboard. Sir, I but talked so for discourse sake merely. Knocking within. Hark, they are there. I am a wretch, a wretch. What will you do, sir? Have you ne'er a current but to leap into? They'll put you to the rack. You must be sudden. Sir, I have an engine. Third merchant within. Sir Politic would be. Second merchant within. Where is he? That I have thought upon before time. What is it? I shall ne'er endure the torture. Mary it is, sir, of a tortoise shell, fitted for these extremities. Pray you, sir, help me. Here I've a place, sir, to put back my legs. Please you to lie down, sir. Lies down while Peregrine places the shell upon him. With this cap and my black gloves, I'll lie, sir, like a tortoise, till they are gone. And you call this an engine? Mine own device. Good sir, bid my wife's woman to burn my papers. Exit Peregrine. The three merchants rush in. Where is he hid? We must and will sure find him. Which is his study? Re-enter Peregrine. What are you, sir? I am a merchant that came here to look upon this tortoise. How? St. Mark, what beast is this? It is a fish. Come out here. Nay, you may strike him, sir, and tread upon him. He'll bear a cart. What? To run over him? Yes, sir. Let's jump upon him. Can he not go? He creeps, sir. 
Let's see him creep. No, good sir, you will hurt him. Heart, I will see him creep or prick his guts. Come out here. Pray you, sir. Aside to Sir Politic. Creep a little. Forth. Yet farther. Good sir. Creep. We'll see his legs. They pull off the shell and discover him. Odd so, he has garters. Ay, and gloves. Is this your fearful tortoise? Peregrine, discovering himself. Now, Sir Paul, we are even. For your next project I shall be prepared. I am sorry for the funeral of your notes, sir. Twere a rare motion to be seen in Fleet Street. I in the term. Or Smithfield, in the fair. Methinks tis but a melancholy sight. Farewell, most politic tortoise. Exeunt Peregrine and Merchants. Re-enter Waiting Woman. Where's my lady? Knows she of this? I know not, sir. Enquire. Oh, I shall be the fable of all feasts, the freight of the Gazetti, shipboy's tale, and, which is worst, even talk for ordinaries. My lady's come most melancholy home, and says, sir, she will straight to sea for physic. And I to shun this place and climb for ever, creeping with house on back, and think it well to shrink my poor head in my politic shell. Exeunt. Scene three. A room in Volpone's house. Enter Mosca in the habit of a clarissimo, and Volpone in that of a commandadore. Am I then like him? Oh, sir, you are he. No man can sever you. Good. But what am I? For heaven, a brave clarissimo. Thou becom'st it. Pity thou wert not born one. Mosca, aside. If I hold my maid one, twill be well. I'll go and see what news first at the court. Exit. Do so. My fox is out of his hole, and ere he shall re-enter, I'll make him languish in his borrowed case, except he come to composition with me. Andragino, Castrone, Nano. Enter Andragino, Castrone, and Nano. Here. Here. Go. Recreate yourselves abroad. Go sport. Exeunt. So, now I have the keys, and am possessed. Since he will needs be dead for his time, I'll bury him, or gain by him. I am his heir, and so will keep me, till he share at least. To cousin him of all were but a cheat well placed. No man would construe it a sin. Let his sport pay for it. This is called the fox trap. Exit. Scene four. A street. Enter Corbaccio and Corvino. They say the court is set. We must maintain our first tale good for both our reputations. Why, mine's no tale. My son would there have killed me. That's true, I had forgot. Aside. Mine is, I am sure. But for your will, sir. Aye, I'll come upon him for that hereafter. Now his patron's dead. Enter Volpone. Signor Corvino and Corbaccio, sir, much joy unto you. Of what? The sudden good dropped down upon you. Where? And none knows how, from old Volpone, sir. Out, arrant knave. Let not your too much wealth, sir, make you furious. Away, thou varlet. Why, sir? Dost thou mock me? You mock the world, sir. Did you not change wills? Out, harlot. Oh, belike you are the man, Signor Corvino. Faith, you carry it well. You grow not mad withal. I love your spirit. You are not over-leavened with your fortune. You should have some would swell now, like a wine-fat with such an autumn. Did he give you all, sir? Avoid, you rascal. Troth, your wife has shewn herself a very woman, but you are well, you need not care. You have a good estate to bear it out, sir, better by this chance, except Corbaccio have a share. Hence, Valet. 
You will not be act known, sir. Why, tis wise. Thus do all gamesters at all games dissemble. No man will seem to win. Exeunt Corvino and Corbaccio. Here comes my vulture, heaving his beak up in the air and snuffing. Enter Voltore. Outstripped thus by a parasite. A slave would run on errands and make legs for crumbs. Well, what I'll do. The court stays for your worship. I e'en rejoice, sir, at your worship's happiness, and that it fell into so learned hands that understand the fingering... What do you mean? I mean to be a suitor to your worship for the small tenement out of reparations that to the end of your long row of houses by the Pescaria. It was, in Volpone's time, your predecessor, ere he grew diseased, a handsome, pretty, customed body-house, as was any in Venice none dispraised, but fell with him, his body and that house decayed together. Come, sir, leave your prating. Why, if your worship give me but your hand, that I may have the refusal I have done. Tis a mere toy to you, sir, candle rents, as your learned worship knows. What do I know? Mary, no end of your wealth, sir, God decrease it. Mistaking knave, what mockst thou my misfortune? Exit. His blessing on your heart, sir, would twere more. Now to my first again, at the next corner. Exit. Scene five, another part of the street. Enter Corbaccio and Corvino. Mosca passes over the stage before them. See, in our habit, see the impudent varlet? That I could shoot mine eyes at him like gunstones. Enter Volpone. But is this true, sir, of the parasite? Again, to afflict us, monster. In good faith, sir, I'm heartily grieved a beard of your grave length should be so overreached. I never brooked that parasite's hair. Methought his nose should cousin. There was still somewhat in his look did promise the bane of a clarissimo. Knave! Methinks yet you that are so traded in the world, a witty merchant, the fine bird Corvino, that have such moral emblems on your name, should not have sung your shame and dropped your cheese to let the fox laugh at your emptiness. Sirrah, you think the privilege of the place and your red saucy cap that seems to me nailed to your jolt head with those two chickens can warrant your abuses. Come you hither. You shall perceive, sir, I dare beat you. Approach. No haste, sir. I do know your valour well, since you durst publish what you are, sir. Tarry, I'd speak with you. Sir, sir, another time. Nay, now. Oh, Lord, sir, I were a wise man would stand the fury of a distracted cuckold. As he is running off, re-enter Mosca. What? Come again? Upon a Mosca, save me! The air's infected where he breathes. Let's fly him. Exeunt Corvino and Corbaccio. Excellent basilisk. Turn upon the vulture. Enter Voltore. Well, flesh fly, it is summer with you now. Your winter will come on. Good advocate, prithee not rail, nor threaten out of place thus. Thou'lt make a solecism, as madam says. Get you a big in more, your brain breaks loose. Exit. Well, sir. Would you have me beat the insolent slave, throw dirt upon his first good clothes? This same is doubtless some familiar. Sir, the court in troth stays for you. I am mad, a mule that never read Justinian should get up and ride an advocate. Had you no quirk to avoid gullage, sir, by such a creature? I hope you do but jest. He has not done it. Tis but confederacy to blind the rest. You are the heir. A strange, officious, troublesome knave, thou dost torment me. I know. It cannot be, sir, that you should be cousined. Tis not within the wit of man to do it. You are so wise, so prudent, and tis fit that wealth and wisdom still should go together. Exeunt. Scene six. The Scrutineo, or Senate House. Enter Avocatori, Notario, Bonario, Celia, Corbaccio, Corvino, Commandadori, Safi, etc. 
Are all the parties here? All but the advocate. And here he comes. Enter Voltore and Volpone. Then bring them forth to sentence. O oh, my most honoured fathers, let your mercy once win upon your justice to forgive. I am distracted. Volpone, aside. What will he do now? Oh, I know not which to address myself to first, whether your fatherhoods or these innocents. Corvino, aside. Will he betray himself? Whom equally I have abused, out of most covetous ends. The man is mad. What's that? He is possessed. For which, now struck in conscience, here, I prostrate myself at your offended feet for pardon. Arise. Arise. Oh, heaven, how just thou art. Volpone, aside. I am caught in mine own noose. Corvino, to Corbaccio. Be constant, sir. Nought now can help but impudence. Speak forward. Silence. It is not passion in me, reverend fathers, but only conscience. Conscience, my good sires, that makes me now tell truth. That parasite, that knave, hath been the instrument of all. Where is that knave? Fetch him. I go. Exit. Grave fathers, this man's distracted. He confessed it now, for hoping to be old Volpone's heir, who is now dead. How? Is Volpone dead? Dead since, grave fathers. Oh, sure, vengeance. Stay. Then he was no deceiver. Oh, no, none. The parasite, grave fathers. He does speak out of mere envy, cause the servants made the thing he gaped for. Please, your fatherhoods, this is the truth, though I'll not justify the other, but he may be some deal faulty. Aye, to your hopes as well as mine, Corvino. But I'll use modesty. Pleaseth your wisdoms to view these certain notes, and but confer them. As I hope favour, they shall speak clear truth. The devil has entered him. Or bides in you. We have done ill by a public officer to send for him, if he be here. For whom? Him that they call the parasite. Tis true, he is a man of great estate now left. Go you, and learn his name, and say, The court entreats his presence here, but to the clearing of some few doubts. Exit Notary. This same's a labyrinth. Stand you unto your first report. My state, my life, my fame. Where is it? Are at the stake. Is yours too? The advocate's a knave, and has a forked tongue. Speak to the point. So is the parasite too. This is confusion. I do beseech your fatherhood's read but those. Giving them the papers. And credit nothing the false spirit hath writ. It cannot be, but he's possessed, grave fathers. The scene closes. Scene seven. A street. Enter Volpone. To make a snare for mine own neck, and run my head into it willfully, with laughter, when I had newly scaped, was free and clear out of mere wantonness. Oh, the dull devil was in this brain of mine when I devised it and Mosca gave it second. He must now help to sear up this vein, or we bleed dead. Enter Nano, and Regino, and Castrone. How now? Who let you loose? Whither go you now? What, to buy gingerbread, or to drown kitlings? Sir, Master Mosca called us out of doors, and bid us all go play, and took the keys. Yes. Did Master Mosca take the keys? Why so? I'm farther in. These are my fine conceits. I must be merry with a mischief to me. What a vile wretch was I that could not bear my fortune soberly. I must have my crotchets and my conundrums. Well, go you and seek him. His meaning may be truer than my fear. Bid him he straight come to me to the court. Thither will I, and if to be possible, unscrew my advocate upon new hopes. When I provoked him, then I lost myself. Exeunt. Scene 8. The Scrutineo, or Senate House. 
avocatori bonario celia corbaccio corvino commandadori safi etc as before these things can ne'er be reconciled he here showing the papers professeth that the gentleman was wronged and that the gentlewoman was brought thither forced by her husband and there left most true how ready is heaven to those that pray but that Volpone should have ravished her he holds utterly false knowing his impotence grave fathers he's possessed again i say possessed nay if there be possession and obsession he has both here comes our officer enter volpone the parasite will straight be here grave fathers you might invent some other name sir Vorlet. did not the notary meet him not that i know his coming will clear all yet it is misty may it please your fatherhoods volpone whispers to voltore sir the parasite willed me to tell you that his master lives that you are still the man your hopes the same and this was only a jest how sir to try if you were firm and how you stood affected ah sure he lives do i live sir oh me i was too violent sir you may redeem it they said you were possessed fall down and seem so i'll help to make it good voltore falls god bless the man stop your wind hard and swell see 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 he vomits crooked pins his eyes are set like a dead hare's hung in a poulter's shop his mouth's running away do you see senor now it is in his belly ay the devil now in his throat ay i perceive it plain twill out twill out stand clear see where it flies in shape of a blue toad with a bat's wings do you not see it sir what i think i do tis too manifest look he comes to himself where am i take good heart the worst is past sir you are dispossessed what accident is this sudden and full of wonder if he were possessed as it appears all this is nothing he has been often subject to these fits shew him that writing do you know it sir volpone whispers to voltore deny it sir forswear it know it not yes i do know it well it is my hand but all that it contains is false oh practice what maze is this is he not guilty then whom you there name the parasite grave fathers no more than his good patron old volpone why he is dead oh no my honoured fathers he lives how lives lives this is subtler yet you said he was dead never you said so i heard so here comes the gentleman make him way enter mosca a stool fourth avocatore aside a proper man and where will pony did a fit match for my daughter give him way volpone aside to mosca mosca i was almost lost the advocate had betrayed all but now it is recovered all's on the hinge again say i am living what busy knave is this most reverend fathers i sooner had attended your grave pleasures but that my order for the funeral of my dear patron did require me volpone aside mosca whom i intend to bury like a gentleman volpone aside i quick and cousin me of all still stranger more intricate and come about again fourth avocatore aside it is a match my daughter is bestowed mosca aside to volpone will you give me half first i'll be hanged i know your voice is good cry not so loud demand the advocate sir did you not affirm volpone was alive yes and he is this gentleman told me so aside to mosca thou shalt have half whose drunkard is this same speak some that know him 
I never saw his face. Aside to Volpone. I cannot now afford it you so cheap. No! What say you? The officer told me. I did, Grey Fathers, and will maintain he lives with mine own life, and that this creature... Points to Mosca. Told me. Aside. I was born with all good stars, my enemies. Most grave fathers, if such an insolence as this must pass upon me, I am silent. T'was not this for which you sent, I hope. Take him away. Mosca! Let him be whipped. Wilt thou betray me, cousin me? And taught to bear himself toward a person of his rank. Avi. The officer sees Volpone. I humbly thank your fatherhoods. Volpone, aside. Soft, soft, whipped, and lose all that I have. If I confess, it cannot be much more. Sir, are you married? They will be allied anon. I must be resolute. The fox shall here uncase. Throws off his disguise. Patron! Nay, now, my ruin shall not come alone. Your match I'll hinder sure. My substance shall not glue you, nor screw you into a family. Why, patron? I am Volpone, and this is my knave. Pointing to Mosca. This? To Voltore. His own knave. This? To Corbaccio. Avarice's fool. This? To Corvino. A chimera of Whithall fool and knave. And reverend fathers, since we all can hope naught but a sentence, let's not now despair it. You hear me brief. May it please your fatherhoods. Silence. The knot is now undone by miracle. Nothing can be more clear. Or can more prove these innocent. Give them their liberty. Heaven could not long let such gross crimes be hid. If this be held the highway to get riches, may I be poor. This is not the gain, but torment. These possess wealth as sick men possess fevers, which trulier may be said to possess them. Disrobe that parasite. Most, Most honoured, honoured fathers. fathers. Can you plead aught to stay the course of justice? If you can, speak. We beg favour. And mercy. You hurt your innocence, suing for the guilty. Stand forth and first the parasite. You appear to have been the chiefest minister, if not plotter, in all these lewd impostures. And now, lastly, have with your impudence abused the court. In habit of a gentleman of Venice, being a fellow of no birth or blood, for which our sentence is, first, thou be whipped, then live perpetual prisoner in our galleys. I thank you for him. Bane to thy wolvish nature. Deliver him to the Safi. Mosca is carried out. Thou, Volfone, by blood and rank a gentleman, canst not fall under like censure. But our judgment on thee is that thy substance be all straight confiscate to the hospital of the incurably. And since the most was gotten by imposture, by feigning lame, gout, palsy, and such diseases, thou art to lie in prison, cramped with irons, until thou be a sick and lame indeed. Remove him. He is taken from the bar. This is called mortifying of a fox. Thou, Volturé, to take away the scandal thou hast given all worthy men of thy profession, art banished from their fellowship and our state. Corbacchio, bring him near. We here possess thy son of all thy estate, and confine thee to the monastery of San Spirito, where, since thou knewest not how to live well here, thou shalt be learned to die well. Ah. What said he? You shall know anon, sir. Thou, Corvino, shalt be straight embarked from thine own house, and rode round about Venice, through the Grand Canal, wearing a cap with fair long ass's ears instead of horns, and so to mount a paper pinned on thy breast to the Berlina. Yes, 
and have mine eyes beat out with stinking fish, bruised fruit, and rotten eggs. Tis well. I'm glad I shall not see my shame yet. And to excapate thy wrongs done to thy wife, thou art to send her home to her father, with her dowry troubled. These are all our judgments. Honored Honor fathers. Which may not be revoked. Now you begin, when crimes are done, and past and to be punished, to think what your crimes are, away with them. Let all that see these vices thus rewarded, take heart and love to study em. Mischiefs feed like beasts, till they are fat, and then they bleed. Exeunt. Volpone comes forward. The seasoning of a play is the applause. Now, though the fox be punished by the laws, he yet doth hope there is no suffering due for any fact which he hath done gainst you. If there be, censure him. Here he doubtful stands. If not, fare jovially and clap your hands. Exit. End of Act 5. End of Volpone. Or the Fox by Ben Jonson.